Oh, you made the it. alien sound that Joe Rogan makes. Adam Curry, John C. Devorak. It's Thursday, November 1st, 2018. This is your award-winning Give Nation Media Assassination, episode 1082. This is No Agenda. Riding the caravan of love and broadcasting live from the capital of the drone star state here in downtown Austin, Tejas, in the Cludio in the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where everyone's talking about Beto. I'm John C. Devorak. It's Craig Bott and Buzzkill. <laughs> in the morning. Okay, that's one way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were talking. Maybe uh, we should just reiterate that John and I pretty much rarely speak during the week. Well, we don't speak at all, I'd say. Maybe an email or two. And you're a little more active on Twitter, so you know I see what you're thinking more than usual. But we don't speak. We don't talk about what we're going to do. We each do our own show preparation. Zephyr. I, ah, right in time. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I'm so happy. It's going to be a good show. Um, hey, so I have no idea what John's clips are. I mean, I, I look at them when they come in. It's like, okay, I can see the titles and I see if there's anything that I have as well and how we might fold it in. That's it. And then just before the show, I don't know, we were talking about, oh, yes, Beto. Beto. Robert Francis. O'Rourke. Robert Francis. Beto. 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 And uh, I said, did you know that Beto uh, is married to a an heiress of a $20 billion, a reported $20 billion fortune? And she's the only child. Yeah, and I said, what? <laughs> they don't play that up much, do they? They don't play it up at all. I just heard it from you this morning. That's why I wanted to talk about it. He is the daughter I mean- of William D. Sanders. A.K.A. the Warren Buffett of real estate, according to Bloomberg. And she is his only daughter. His portfolio was valued at about $20 billion. Wow. Yeah. So, so this guy's running. So, <laughs> so he's collecting all this money. He's collected more money for a guy in a, in a pretty losing yeah, six, state. $69 million. Um, I, I, actually, I looked at Open, open Secrets. What is it? Open is it Open Secrets who does all the it's one of them, yeah. And it looks like the majority coming from Alphabet, uh, well, actually Google. Yeah, that's Google. The Google boys are are trying to buy uh, Texas. <laughs> Good luck, Google boys. Let me see, Beto O'Rourke. Uh, I wasn't all that prepared. Here, campaign finance summary. Here we go. Here it is. Um, cont- top contributor, University of Texas, of course. Alphabet. Why, wait a minute. <laughs> why is the University of Texas? Do they did they give any money to Cruz? I mean, why are they giving money to anybody? This is a, they're always jacking up the tuitions on the students, yet they're giving money to political candidates. Oh yeah, this, oh, they do a lot of that. All universities do that. What are you talking about? These are political operations. Hello. Yes, three hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. Three hundred twelve. Three hundred sixty-five thousand three hundred twelve. Yeah. Al- Alphabet Inc.'s Inc. is second spot. Then J Street, which is lobbyist. Lobbyist. J yeah. Street. I, yeah. Then University of California, one hundred thirty-one thousand four hundred four dollars. Uh, you know, the, the University of California gave Beto yes. hundred over a hundred thousand dollars. That's what you're telling me. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Well, the next time they, go, but I think they've been taken off the list. But they always call the alumni up asking for money, and I said. I would give you money, but you're just going to give it to to Obama. That's what I had last time I talked right. to him, which was right. to Obama ministers because they gave Obama a million dollars. I'm thinking, why are you asking for my ten dollars, you know, or my fifty or whatever it is? And I won't even give it to the library because I figure they're just funneling that over to some political contribution. <laughs> if the University of California has got enough money that they can blow it on the Beto thing. I'm not going to donate anything. <laughs> they're, they're just screwing their alumni with this. I'm, I'm not a supporter. Don't blame it on sunshine. Don't blame it on moonlight. Blame yeah, it on yeah. the Beto. The Beto. Uh, AT&T, and right after University of California, with uh, also a little over $100,000. Now, by industry, according to Open Secrets, Democrat liberal, total of $8.8 $8 million, retired, just a category retired, $3 million. What was that? ARP. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Lawyers and law firms, $3 million. Education, that's 2.6. So there's more than just uh, UT and University of California. 
health professionals, 1.3. So it seems like a lot of special interests are interested in him, especially J Street. Come on, J Street. Now, I guess I figured they can get Ted Cruz out. But let me move something. Hold on. What are you moving? I'm moving my little thing that just fell off the shelf. Um, You keep your little thing on the shelf? My computer. Oh. Um, Here, Cruz. Now you were saying that there was a big push on the media to get this to get this guy some attention. I, there's a number of things I want to mention. I want to talk about that because I have a thought on that, and I also want to talk about, about the uh, fact that the Democratic National Committee has been telling Beto to give them some of the money and he <laughs> won't, won't do it. He's got he's got sixty nine million. So hey, man. Hey, there's other candidates that need to use it. <laughs> And he's not spending it all, apparently. Well, he has ten million left like when I looked yesterday. Oh, well, he spent quite a bit then. Yeah, yeah, he spent it's quite a bit, quite a bit. But he's getting a lot of exposure. He was on, uh, he's, he's popping up everywhere on Pod Save America, and uh, Chris Matthews yesterday did a town hall at uh, Houston University of Houston. And he got all yeah. this, but here's what I think is going on with it. I think that you're going to see even more of him before this, before next week, is the media. Is promoting the heck out of this guy because they've got to get the, the old rules back on track, meaning the more you spend, the more <laughs> likely you are to win. Yes. And this yes. guy has got is spending, he spent fifty nine million according to you, uh was holding back ten. And he's gonna outspend Cruz, there's no doubt about that. So he should win well, or he, they he gotta outra- find he, get him to win. He outraised Cruz for sure. Yeah. By a good twenty million, I think. Yeah, so he should. They got to get him to win because that, that if they can, it if breaks, they can get one, breaks it. Yeah, one guy like this to win, and they can. They're, they're on easy street because now everyone knows they got to spend more money. Right. <laughs> yes, everybody wins, especially yeah, everybody the consultants. Wins. <laughs> the consultants win everybody biggest. Wins. Yeah. I don't think he's going to win. I don't think so either. It's looking. It's looking like I don't know. I don't think so. I probably I the care of that presentable. I, I mean, John. Looking. Let's be honest. You're talking about Texas. You're talking yeah. about you know the, the it's we are our own country here, and you know we got no problem with Beto and the signs and everything. I got no problem with the guy. He seems like a nice guy, uh, but you know we've been sold this uh, this threat of the caravan. It's coming right towards Woo! us. This, this clearly is not a coincidence. <laughs> so the caravan is the and caravan it's of to love. Texas. Yeah, it's heading towards Texas, exactly. Yeah, and they're, they're horrible people on it. Oh, it's in horrible. It. Well, you know, they've they've, <laughs> they've, they've, uh, they've taken. I guess Fox has kind of taken. Uh, um, the, they've they've turned on themselves. Uh, Shepard Smith turned on his own. Oh, company. Shep Smith has been. He, he's the he's the token. Uh, it's a virtual liberal guy. To, he wants yeah. to get out. So he's doing everything he can to get fired, but they won't fire him. But let's play the Shepard Smith no invasion clip. Tomorrow, the migrants, according to Fox News reporting, are more than two months away, if any of them actually come here. But tomorrow is one week before the midterm election, which is what all of this is about. There is no invasion. No one's coming to get you. There's nothing at all to worry about. When they did this to us, got us all riled up in April, remember? The result was 14 arrests. We're America. We can handle it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, it's, they need to do this kind of stuff. And Shep is the perfect guy for it. They, they love him there. Come on. We know who runs all these media outlets. Yeah, Democrats. It's the Democrats who run it. So now, that's fine. That's fine. That's so it. they took – so because of this and other things, they took a big chunk out of Lou Dobbs' uh, show and, and shelved it and kept it there. And they took it off all, all the recordings even though there was one on the YouTube, which I listened to, because it had to do with this 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 caravan. Mm-hmm. And so if you read the right-wing press, oh, my God, they're trying to suppress this well, information. Hold on. I, 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 have, I have the clips. I have the clip from you. Lou. Have the Lou Dobbs. Yes, clips? yes, I have the Lou okay, Dobbs well, before clip. You, I'm gonna. I don't want to de- demean demean your clips because I had the clips too, and I think that they took them off because they're they're incredibly boring. Well, it's just to to show. I mean, this is one thing. It, what happened is 
here's the sequence of events. Caravan invasion, scary. Then we get Gab Guy kills Jews in synagogue because Soros. Soros becomes the, the comp- so widespread that the Dutch national broadcaster in the Netherlands wrote an article about Soros. And, some, and I think they were just translating. I've told they do this all the time. They're not real journalists. Most of them just wake up in the morning, look at the U.S. papers. Eh, okay, I'll just translate this. And one line said, the Jew Soros, da, 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 da. And that one line caused a national uproar. Uh, and what they were, and what the there's the Jew Soros, the Jew Soros, and so I think, and that was the national uproar in Holland. Yes, I think that it was translated. It was supposed to be the Jewish Soros, and they were trying to uh, show that this that he's being blamed for this because he's Jewish. That's their story, but that's not the way it was written. The Jew Soros. Uh, so you get you know Robbie <laughs> Naftaniel from the. Uh, oh, the, the no, Dutch Anti Defamation League. Oh no, no, it was it, it got incredibly crazy, and you know, and so now you have loot. Well, I'll, I'll just I'll play this. Do you, you have the just a little bit of the clip? You don't have any of it of the Lou Dobbs stuff. No, I, I I I I thought it was so. No offense to your clip, but I thought it was the reason they took it off because it was just. It was boring. Is the this the guy with the judicial watch? Right, right. Yes, but it's not Tom yeah. Fitton. It's uh, no, no, it's Chris not Fitton. It's some some Farrell. lackey who's and, got nothing going on. And apparently he's, he's not been, interesting. Apparently he's been banned from Fox. He's yeah, not well, supposedly. Well, <laughs> yeah, next, for being dull. <laughs> my next guest just returned from well, it is Fox Business News. It's you know, it's yeah. a, a, yeah. a model where he spent four days on the ground witnessing the caravan just north of the Honduran border. Joining us tonight, Chris Farrell, Director of Investigations for Judicial Watch. Oh, Director of Chris, Investigations. Chris, good to have you with us. Woo. I know that uh, uh, this uh, caravan was a subject of considerable interest for you, for Judicial Watch, uh, and certainly for the American people. Give us your uh, first, uh, and I'm going to, because we have limited time, ask you to be as succinct uh, as possible. Limited time, sure. Uh, your thoughts on what you witnessed and what you saw and heard. It's an overwhelmingly male caravan of mid-teens to mid-40s. I'd say the women and children are a super minority. There are certainly criminal elements rolled into the caravan. Uh, There were children that were recovered from a human smuggling operation today. Uh, The Guatemalans are trying to hold them back and turn them back, but it's a very grave situation. Leftist groups uh, reported to be uh, the organizers playing instrumental roles and financial roles. Leading the Uh, way. Tell us what you can. (laughs) Sure. Uh, Look, this is a criminal involvement on the part of these leftist groups. It's a highly organized, very elaborate, sophisticated operation. I have that from the highest levels of the the Guatemalan government. They're investigating those groups criminally. (laughs) And I strongly urge President Trump and Attorney General Sessions to do the same. Here it comes. A lot of these folks also have affiliates who are getting money from the Soros-occupied State Department, and that is a very great oh, concern. Yeah. That That's it. it. That was it. It was the yeah, Soros. I agree. I agree. The Soros. Now, let me just explain one thing about this. I think what he's trying to say, it comes out in a very, very unfortunate way, is that the Open Society Institute, uh, George Soros, is, um, his, the mothership of all of his philanthropic deeds, gives so much money to all these little NGOs, just hundreds, hundreds of NGOs. But a lot of the money does come from USAID, and that is directly from the State Department. I think that's what the guy is trying to say, but it comes out in a way that Brian Seltzerwater over there at CNN, well, uh, he understood the uh, the dog whistle. Last night after, I think it was. Oh, and this is with, uh, what's his face? Um it's a crystal, Bill Crystal, I think. The killing, right? Someone oh, on God. Fox Business had a guest talking about, what was it, the Soros Occupied State Department? Yeah, let's pull that up because a tweet about this by Josh Marshall went viral. We can show you the viral. tweet. I don't want to play the clip from Lou Dobbs because it's so gross. Yeah. I don't want to give it any more oxygen, but the uh, point of the it's tweet. It's so gross. I don't want to give it any more oxygen. How is it so, what is gross about it? Well, the, well Crystal just said the gross part. That was it. That was, there's nothing else in the boring clip, but this continues. Uh, Sorry, the point of the segment, as Josh Marshall is saying here, uh, is that Lou Dobbs had a guest on from Judicial Watch saying the caravan from Central America was being funded or directed by the Soros-occupied state. So the Soros occupied is a play on Zionist-occupied government, which is a very familiar anti-Semitic (laughs) trope. This is 
is great. Soros is Jewish, what? and his, uh, a bit of, the right has been obsessed with him for that, among other reasons. And this brings it all together. So it's the Jews, the evil Jews, occupying the U.S. government and bringing in alien invaders into this country. And that well, has been, you don't have to go that Yeah, but, yeah, but there, there's something to this, and I'll get to it in a moment. Far, uh, unfortunately, into not just right-wing websites, but even out to Fox News, as we just saw, to get that kind of uh, But Fox narrative. is going to say you're blaming them. Are you blaming them? I'm blaming them for putting that guest on the air and not, you know, correcting him in real time. And I, so far as I know, 12 hours later, doing nothing about it. And I'm blaming, honestly, at this level, after we have Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram, and I've known all these people in the past right. on TV every night, I'm blaming the management of Fox and the investors in Fox and the uh, huh. uh, some of the other talent who are decent people at Fox for saying nothing. This has been going on a long time. If you watch Fox in prime time, and I don't, but you read about it and you see clips, it's really appalling. And appalling. everyone just sits back and says, well, that's just Fox. They're making money. Hold on and we're not going to say it, anything. Stop about- it, stop it, stop it. It's you a- can't do what he just did. <laughs> I-, I can't say... These guys are crazy. They're doing all this stuff. I won't watch it. I've never heard a word of it. Yeah, but I've heard the clip and somebody yeah, else told I've me. Read this. about it. Read about Second it. Second hand, I've read yes, about it's it. It's horrible. You can't be a you can't be making these sorts of statements if you're on these shows. Well, Bill Crystal can it, by, by the way, he's a liar because you know he watches this stuff. Of course. Now let me remind you where this comes from. Um and I and I got a couple emails about it. People reminded me of a clip, and I think we brought it up in a very similar fashion. About, uh, and this is, I think a lot of the conspiracy theories from the crazy Jew haters stems from clips like the following. This was a, this is a flashback for the No Agenda show. This, we had this, we played this, it's a very short, 36 seconds, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is Barbara Lerner Specter. She's the founding director of the Paeta Sweden. And uh, you may recall that the Paeta, it's P A E I D A. Paida, Paida, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, they have a mission, and their mission is the multicultural integration, in this case, of Europe. So listen to what she says. I think there's a resurgence of anti-Semitism because at this point in time, Europe has not yet learned how to be multicultural. And I think we're going to be part of the throes of that, of that transformation, which must take place. Europe is not going to be the monolithic... Uh, uh, societies that they once were in the last century. Jews are going to be at the center of that. It's a huge transformation for Europe to make. They are now going into a multicultural mode, and Jews will be resented because of our leading role. But without that leading role and without that transformation, Europe will not survive. <clears throat> so, uh, this is taken quite literally, and I don't know what their mission is. What I'm hearing her say, this is a, the real foundation. Uh, real outfit is she saying the Jews are responsible and it's their mission or at least these Jews it's their mission to create to shepherd in the multicultural society in Europe that's what I'm hearing her say and that's in fact what she said that's creating resentment (laughs) I would think it might yes and so when you get the the uh, what is it, the HEIC, is it the Hebrew International, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Council, um, whatever the uh, the Squirrel Hill Synagogue shooter was posting about? Yeah, he was it's that, about that operation. Well, yes, and you know, he's been over-socialized on, uh, on social networks, and so his, his brain fries, it's, I'm not making excuses, just telling you where it's coming from, and he's heard about this, and when you hear a clip about that, now that pertains to Europe, uh, we've seen some pretty nasty things in Scandinavia, uh, in particular, uh, was it uh, Denmark, where you know where the guy killed like eighty kids? Yeah, I, I, that, yeah, we yeah. didn't cover that well. We covered it very well at the time. I should remember on the island we covered the heck oh, out of about it. Brett, Brett, that's Norway. Oh, Norway. I'm sorry. Why is it saying Denmark? Norway. Yes. So that's why I didn't remember the Denmark thing. Yeah. And, and you know, so, and that was, comes from the same place. But here you have, you know, th- th- what's happened here is you get Bill Crystal um, and Brian Seltzer, I think both Jewish. And, you know, it, what they're doing is, is just f- putting more flames on the fire by going from the Jews are trying to shepherd in the multicultural society, despite what Whitey thinks. I'm just t- not telling you from my perspective, but from what I think these people think. Uh, 
Oh, and here's two Jews who run the media kicking the guy off. I mean, it's, it's, it's very inflammatory. Because that's another staple, anti-Jew staple. Well, that's interesting. So, um, I'm glad you got the, the, the Lou Dobbs clip to show people what it was really about, which was a minor comment that was ill-advised yeah. and boring. <laughs> Quite. Uh, if, you, if you listen to the whole thing, oh, you I go, did. Oh, I did. My <laughs> God, this is why they cut it out. I, I did. I was like, where, where? I mean, it's almost like obfuscating the evidence of fake, fake outrage to me. That's what. That's what it feels more like than anything else. Yes, the fake outrage, and then the well. This remind reminds me actually of the nine one one call at the uh, at <laughs> Sandy the Hook. Yeah, at yeah. Sandy Hook, which we are you trying to get us are you trying to get us deplatformed here? What to, uh, <laughs> we're saying, on a roll today. We, we played the nine one one call, and it was. It was like the Lou Dobbs thing. It was boring. It was yes. nothing going on. Yeah. That's why they didn't want to play it. Yeah. They just made up the fact that it was exciting. Yes. And they, they're making this up, too, that this is, oh, oh, some horrible thing happened on the Lou Dobbs show. And they now they've smeared Lou Dobbs in the process. But it has sparked a national a, a renew with. The, I mean, again, the 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 events are very interesting to watch. And just the sequence is so coincidental where you have. Uh, Texas, lots of money being spent on Beto. You know, we got Lion Ted, Sleepy Ted, whatever it is. We gotta, we gotta hook him up. We can't, we can't, we can't have uh, Texas flip. And I've always said it could flip. It wouldn't be that hard if you had the, you know, if you had the right candidate. And you, I think right candidate may be it, but right candidate would help. I mean, they have, you know, they will vote for a Democrat if it's a, if it's a conser- old fashioned conservative Democrat. Sure. Not Beto. That guy's like no. a, like a screw loose liberal. And so no offense to all the screw loose liberals. But he's got, to but, show. but it's obvious that we're a battleground state for whatever reason, which seems ill advised, but okay. So they pour a lot of well, money. No, in. I don't think it's ill advised. I think they figured Look, we're not getting anywhere with this with our we're not getting the money that we should be getting the media people, the media moguls. And we're not getting the money. But what if we could flip Texas with because we just over we just got a lot of money? Yeah. Texas would be because you're not going to flipping something that's always on the borderline is not. eh, so what? Right. But flipping Texas would, would be, be would like be a, a big deal. Major, would be a major. Big deal boost to the media uh, people that need more money well i tell you austin for one is just beto land i mean there the signs That's the problem uh, the signs are everywhere i think he lives in austin doesn't he no no he lives in uh el paso oh el paso, el paso. Right. anyway so you have the the Beto surgeons, all the money, you know, just to make sure. Let's whether it was instigated on purpose or whatever it is. Caravan, scary invasion. Caravan, scary invasion. Then, by coincidence, some guy goes off on the Jews. I'm just saying it the way he would say it, the Jews, helping them to invade us based on this backstory. Supported by uh, statements such as this, uh, this lady who's in Sweden, uh, and uh, you know, so it, it, he's he has this theory, and he but there's uh, there may be some truth to it. I don't know. Some he goes off, uh, kills people, and then the caravan story turns into you know, well, you know, it's it's George Soros, oh Jew. And then we shut it all down, shut down the whole conversation. It seems like both, if I, if I wasn't so skeptical, <laughs> you'd think both sides are, you know, this is, a, I always have to remind myself, uh, the elections really matter in the power structure. I have no doubt people are willing to kill, maim, organize. <laughs> no, I'm seriously, you can get someone killed in, in Holland for 5,000 euros these days. It's gone down quite a bit. You know, the people have I, there's no one. These people don't give a crap. They'll kill anything if if it if it can get them Texas or whatever it is. It, or both sides, Republican, they're, they're all crazy. There's crazy powers at work. So yeah, well, wouldn't surprise this'll, me. This will slow down after the midterms. Well, yes, of course. Hopefully, not too much because the <laughs> show will suffer. <laughs> um, I had. Uh, I can, had, can we well, stay on, on this, this for a sec? Can we stay on the? Yeah, we're gonna stay on it. I just gonna say I was got some. Uh, I've got some more stuff. 
Um, that I don't know if it veers off too much, but I'm, for example, the Don Lemon. Thing oh, no, 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 that's ve- no, it's veering off too much. Okay, no, well, no, 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 no. You know what? Actually, it's a good idea. Do you have the full Don Lemon? I don't have the I full do. thing. I got the, I got the middle. Because here's what's going on. Well, and how long is your clip? Two minutes. Okay, you're yeah, you want it. You want it in context. Um, and then I've, I've noticed over the past four weeks, there's been an increased. Uh, I'm seeing increasingly videos going viral that uh, sh- uh, that show Democrats being a holes, racist, etc. But they are clipped out of context, and someone's yes. doing it much more professionally than I've ever seen before. In fact, I That's even got duped do by it. one. I, what you, right. you want? Right. Um, and so I do have some examples of that coming up later. But this one of Don Lemon uh, actually is entirely uh, in context. Uh, and here it is with uh, the, Cro- the Cuomo kid. It's not just Pittsburgh. It's not just the bomber. There was another hate-filled criminal just last week in Kentucky. Another white man, history of violence, custody for shooting and killing two African-Americans at a grocery store, Kroger's. But what he tried to do was barge into a predominantly black church. He failed. And then he picked a secondary target. He's being investigated for hate crimes. Don Lemon is here right now. We barely had time to cover it because we were distracted by another extremist mm. that was doing bad things in the name of hate. Yeah. And then now another one. And you have all of them in a row. And, you know, we talked, we messaged about this a little bit this weekend. I keep trying to point out to people not to demonize any one group or any one ethnicity. But we keep thinking that the biggest terror threat is something else. Some, some, some people who are marching, you know, towards the border like it's imminent. And when the last time they did this, a couple hundred people came and they, you know, most of them did get into the country. Most of them tired, you know, got tuckered out before they even made it to the border. Tuckered out. Um, uh-huh. So we have to stop demonizing people and realize this is the best part. He keeps saying we got to stop demonizing people, man. You got to stop. This is this is Don Lemon, serious Don. Stop demonizing. You know, got tuckered out before they stop even demonizing. made it to the border. Um, so we have to stop demonizing people and realize the biggest terror threat in this country is white men, most of them radicalized right up to the right. them. And we have to start doing something about them. There is yes. no travel ban <laughs> on me. them. Travel ban. There is no ban on, you know, they had the Muslim ban. There is no white guy ban. Oh, come on. So what I do we one. do about that? <laughs> so, and, and, and first of all, do? let me just Wait say Wait a minute, this. stop. <laughs> he asked a rhetorical question. There's no white guy ban. What do we do about that? <laughs> As if that's a question anybody's asking. Now, so at this point, because I've seen the viral clip, I thought, okay, you know, there's probably something, some context that is not there for whatever reason. Ban on them. There is no ban on, you know, they have the Muslim ban. There is no white guy ban. So what do we do about that? So, and, and, and first of all, let me just say this. By the way, stop, stop again. The, um. The Mus- it was never a Muslim ban. It was a ban specific to certain, certain countries. countries yes. And white guys lived in those countries, and white guys were also banned. Don Lemon is, uh, uh, Don- I don't know if he's dating or married to a white guy. His his boyfriend or husband is a white guy. Oh. But he's he's a good kind of white guy. See, we have, yeah, to, we have so. to start getting down. So it's like gay. 20 seconds. There you go. Maurice Stollard is the name and Vicki Jones. And they have been lost in all of this. Two people who were killed on Wednesday that you talked about. They have been lost about this. And I know that people feel that this story has not gotten enough coverage. And we will honor them tonight in our program. But go on, Chris. Sorry. Good. No, no, no. I'm going to do it in the closing. You're making the right point. You're covering the right story, and I appreciate you for that. I appreciate you, man. All right. So it's true. What he said really came out of his pie hole. That's it's after seconds after saying we got to stop demonizing people, (laughs) but I guess white guys aren't people or something. Something. This anti-white thing that's going on. Coincidentally. The murder of Whitey Bulger. Now, Whitey. Now, <laughs> this has multiple layers, actually, John. This has multiple layers. It, it piles on to that. I do have a Whitey Bulger clip. We'll play it later because it's really not about this anti-white no, thing. But it is. But it, it is, could be. It, it is good. I, I read this morning that uh, they cut his tongue out. No, no. they. No, well, the latest that I heard. Here's what I That's heard. That's what I got this morning. 
Oh yeah, it, that, I, my understanding is they attempted to cut his tongue out. Okay, maybe, but uh, well, let's. Then they, but they did gouge his eyes out. Just briefly on it's this, just just, br- just briefly on uh, on Whitey Bulger, and uh, by coincidence, uh, HLN Headline News, a CNN uh, sub affiliate, you know their little sister station, did a, had a two hour special running uh, all day yesterday about Whitey Bulger and. You know, was he uh, was he a snitch uh, for the FBI? Was he not? You know, he claimed he wasn't. There's you know, there's an incredible history behind uh, Whitey Bulger. It's the FBI that tipped him off to get let him escape. The whole th- Whitey Bulger story is a huge embarrassment for the FBI. Yeah, but uh, if they're trying to make amends uh, through its HLN. They're not going to get anywhere. So. Um, Republican Louis Gohmert wrote a couple of years ago a long blog post, and I've put it into the show notes, about Robert Mueller, who at the time was very involved. See, there was also a rogue outfit of the FBI in Boston, and they were completely integrated with the gangs, with the Whitey Bulger, ga- Bulger gangs, and they became criminal themselves. And from what I understand, if you read Louis Gohmert's public blog post, he says that Robert Mueller has a lot of problems uh, regarding Whitey Bulger. And I think because Mueller's about to come out with his report, either before or after the midterm, doesn't really matter. After. That's, that's what we're being told. Um, I believe that two things, again, coincidence we got Whitey Bulger, very famous, a complete corrupt FBI at the time. Robert Mueller, at a, not the director, but high level in the FBI. And then all of a sudden we have uh, allegations, whether they're bullcrap or not, you know, of, uh, that he, you know, sexual assault. Mueller is under attack now. Yeah, I have. A and they had and someone had to kill. I think they had to kill Bulger to shut him up because. You know, there's stories that he was about to blow the lid on the FBI, which could have totally, di- even just the assumption, could have completely discredited Mueller. Well, they kept. Uh, well, first of all, they I I, I can tell you that the uh, whole uh, Mueller targeting is a hoax. Well, the 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 women thing sounds like a hoax. Yeah, I'm not thinking no, that's the whole, real. The, the letter that was sent to the journalist, which was posted, that letter I, I was a hoax. I, I don't know what letter you're talking to, talking about. There was a letter that was sent to a number of journalistic outlets. Uh, I have a copy Recent, somewhere. Recently or a long time ago? That was the one that set off this whole thing. It was a ho- – the, the letter was sent to uh, uh, World Net Daily, uh, just about all the oh, major newspapers. About the, about the women who were, who were yeah. being paid. That yeah. letter – the letter, the letter itself was a hoax. Yeah, sure. The letter itself was a hoax, and it was – and it's structured like a hoax. Yes, and it was designed to embarrass the media because nobody did any research. They never found out who wrote the letter. They didn't do any of this because was, the entire letter was a hoax done by a couple of guys back east. You want you want to hear the uh, the NPR report <laughs> of this of this letter? It's some pretty funny wording. NPR National Security Editor too. Phil Ewing joins us now. Phil, this is weird, but this what do weird. we know so far about this story? It's a very weird story. It, if it's a hoax, it appears to be a hoax within a hoax. So. <laughs> They're really stretching now. Uh, it's there not were these a hoax within a hoax. It's a hoax it's within a, a hoax. hoax. It's a hoax within a hoax. Allegations that came into inboxes in Washington of reporters, including in PR, from someone who called herself a woman in Florida who had allegedly been offered money to make these false charges against Mueller. And what may be the case is that woman actually does not exist and that those false charges were, in fact, false charges about false charges. <laughs> what isn't clear is whether this was uh, intended to embarrass the special counsel office or just to embarrass the journalists who had been sent this email as they tried to investigate and report on it now that pretty much uh, backs your story up the hoax within a hoax within a hoax yeah, well, <laughs> but, yeah. Here, here's here's an interesting little factoid and you actually may not have even realized you were part of this after sunday show uh you know i always Go through the, the tweeter line, timeline, see what people are saying, make sure everyone can receive it. You know, if I, if I, of course, I, if I mess something up, I have to go correct something. And I, if, you know, if someone retweets the show, I'll, I'll give them a little like, you know, hey, thanks for retweeting, like, like, like. And there was this, you know, one producer, I, get, I presume, who liked it. And then all of a sudden, some guy jumps in and starts yelling at him, like, you know, you're full of crap and all this. And you and I are both tagged in this tweet stream. And 
uh, this turned the guy who who liked and retweeted the show was Jacob Wall. This is one of the main guys who was supposed to have created this hoax, and here he is liking our show. And then some other guy comes in like, you're full of crap and you're Jacob Wall. You're full of this. And and somehow <laughs> we're both in this timeline and more people jump on. And then someone says something about, you know, hoax. And then you think that they're saying something about you. And you're like, show me where I said hoax. And then the guy comes back. Hey, you old clown. Shut up. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> learn how Twitter works. Like wow, how I don't want to be guy, yeah. Well, that that old that clown that said that had like four followers. There are way too many people following the two of us that are uh, got two followers, three followers, four followers. I go and they they come in with these snipey remarks. I rarely respond to them. Right, I but one of but, but that hoax what thing. I found inter- but, interesting is one of the main players of this hoax <laughs> apparently listens to our show. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not convinced that he is actually the hoaxer. No, but, I don't know either. But yes, it's good. Well, it's good. He should listen to the show. He probably get some good ideas. Um, anyway, back to this whole thing. Mm-hmm. You want it. Let's get these out of the way since we're, I think it's part of the bigger discussion, which we seem to be having about Whitey. <laughs> let's get the Whitey Bulger dead clip out of the way so we can hear at least understand how great it was that he was killed. For many victims of James Whitey Bulger's <laughs> reign of terror, his violent death Tuesday seemed all too fitting. He deserved a slow death, and that's what I hope he got. I'm going to buy myself a bottle of champagne, and I'm going to pop that cork. We are celebrating the uh, the death of Whitey Bulger. Radio host and Boston Herald columnist Howie Carr says Bulger's ordered a hit on him after he started writing about the Irish mobster. According to one of his associates, they, uh, they got some uh, C4 explosives from some of their crooked FBI agents and tried to blow me up with it, putting it in a basketball. According to the Boston Globe, Baldur's nice. eyes were nearly gouged out, and two inmates, including a convicted mafia hitman, were seen on surveillance video entering Baldur's cell Tuesday morning. I'm glad he did it. If I could, I'd put money in his canteen for him. Bulger rose to power by ratting out his rivals. In the 70s through the 90s, he seemingly ran the Winter Hill gang with impunity, having paid off police and FBI agents. No! No! Bulger's brutality and ruthlessness inspired Jack Nicholson's character in The Departed. And Johnny Depp played him in the movie Black Mass. In 1995, tipped off to an imminent federal indictment, Bulger and his longtime girlfriend and Catherine Gregg went on the run, landing him on the FBI's most wanted list. When they were finally found 16 years later, they were using fake names and posing as retirees in Southern California. Scott Gariola, the FBI special agent who arrested Bulger, spoke with 60 Minutes Steve Croft in 2013. I asked him to identify himself, and that didn't go over well. He asked me to F and identify myself, which I did. And I asked him, I said, are you are you Whitey Bulger? He said, yes. You're not supposed to be happy when someone dies, but this guy was a monster, a fiend, and one of the most horrible people I ever hoped to meet. I do like the subtle persuasion of kill Whitey. Yes, kill Whitey. <laughs> and, and we're glad Whitey's dead. Yeah. And we're glad it's Whitey's subtle. dead. It's subtle. It's the, it's this subtle. is all the message. This is the message right here. Kill Whitey. We're kill glad Whitey. Whitey's dead. Yeah. Now. Which is in coincidence with the Don Lemon commentary and a lot of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, the the funny thing about this, about the Whitey Bulger thing was that he, uh, besides being tipped off by the FBI so he could escape and kind of live, he was 89. But the federal prisons, prison guys kept moving him from prison to prison. I think they were trying to get him killed. And they finally found a prison with these guys, this one guy in particular who was like a fanatic. Is it looks like a good looking guy too? A Greek, uh, Greek, uh, never a made man, Greek uh, hitman, <laughs> and who hated two things, according to one of the reports. He hated snitches, and he hated whim- uh, people who abused women. Mm. And Whitey was both. He used to kill women. Ah, uh, yeah. He, him, and a, a friend of his in the prison who probably was yeah, just ni- another- yeah nice guys. They took him, you know, stuffed something in his mouth, and they're starting to kill him by beating him to death. Uh, and they can't seem to really show that, you know, there's no bruises on anybody, I guess. I think this guy's going to kind of get off. Hey, maybe it was an extraction. Maybe Whitey's not dead. Who knows? 
in F- for the FBI? I don't know. I, I'm I'm just throwing stuff out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not I mean, cra- it's, not much it's, crazier it's, than Kill Whitey being related to Don Lemon. I mean, that's <laughs> <laughs> Kill Whitey. <laughs> no, they did kill Whitey, and that's. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, where were we? Well, uh, I can go back to, uh, I have a little clip of Mika talking about the caravan. Oh, okay, let's go back to that. Mika Brzezinski from the Morning Joes. Let's pull back and look at the politics of this. I'm a suburban mom, a privileged one uh, for sure. (laughs) But I think I have a pretty good feel for why a lot of these competitive suburban house districts seem to be trending toward the Democrats. Most days, it seems like the entire Trump presidency has been purposefully geared toward alienating suburban women, some of whom chose Trump over Hillary Clinton, but are now looking to put a check on this out of control presidency. His policies, his scandals, his rhetoric, all things that are deeply disturbing to many Americans. But if you're a woman and a mom and just a regular voter, how can you look at Donald Trump's reaction to those bombs sent to some of his most prominent critics and his graceless behavior in the wake of the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting and not be, to put it bluntly, absolutely disgusted bluntly this week trump will continue to campaign hard for his republican candidates not shying away from making this election a referendum all about him (laughs) there are a lot of segments of the electorate that will determine how things turn out next week but i say i beg i plea to all mothers not just those who live in suburbs but everywhere. Think about what message voting for Republicans will send to Donald Trump. Think about your children. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? You know, who is she kidding? The people that are making it about Donald Trump aren't isn't Donald Trump. It's everybody else. I have a clip. Of Elizabeth Warren being called out. For oh, this is great. I'm glad you and got all that. all she does, she's called out for election campaign viol- violations. It, it doesn't, uh, I, I, I didn't clip it because I wondered if it would work without seeing that silly expression on her face. Because that's very it, key. It works fine. It, I think it key. works fine listening to it. But the thing is, he calls her out on this and she immediately turns it into a Donald Trump thing. And one other thing that really we found out recently I think is pretty unconscionable is the fact that Senator Warren was fundraising illegally using the vote on Justice Kavanaugh, the confirmation vote, to try to raise money for her campaigns. That just came out. You know, that's something that you should not be doing, first of all, when we were having a national discussion about the Supreme Court, it's trying to fundraise off it, but you did, and turns out it's illegal. So can I just yeah, no? Go ahead, please. Yeah. A question here. I I hear Mr. Deal's uh, statement about how wrong uh, it was the way that Dr. Ford was treated, but I don't remember Mr. Deal speaking up when Donald Trump made fun of her. I don't remember Mr. Deal speaking out when the Republicans were actually ramrodding through the Kavanaugh nomination. I I may have just missed it, but I I don't remember it. You know, that's because, Senator Warren, I don't look for every opportunity to try to grandstand. You know, I don't want to call you responding to the mayor of Somerville, Somerville making a pretty negative statement this last week. But the fact of the matter is, that was such an intense moment in our country's history as far as trying to deal with presumption of innocence, the cornerstone of our legal system. And you were willing to throw it right out the window because you were part of the... Senate Democrats who are trying to score political points by using poor Dr. Ford's testimony as a way to drag down a man without any corroborating evidence. So so I don't think I quite understand the answer, (laughs) Uh, because I'm looking for the times when you've called out Donald Trump, when he's made fun of someone like Dr. Ford, when he's made fun of someone who's disabled. I would would like to drill down on what Representative Deal said. Uh, The the fundraising while the vote was being taken on the Kavanaugh hearing, did you or did you not do that? Actually, I don't know, and I don't know what the. I'll there have has to been look. an. Isn't ethics. there an ethics committee? In, in, yes, there's there an ethics complaint? complaint has been filed about a fundraising. <laughs> then, uh, then I will. Uh, I will check into it. But uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, she's toast. Well, 
She's a Democrat and yeah. the, the Massachusetts you know, nuts, they you know, love Democrats. You know what really, um, what was noticeable to me when I saw that clip was the incredible, because we're almost not used to a debate. The last time we saw a debate, uh, well, there was Cruz and Beto. But, you know, really, in your mind, a debate between a Republican and a Democrat is shouting match. It's Trump, you know, bam, bam, bam. And this was, no, 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 no. This guy's no, no, good. No, 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 no. Well, but. But it was very interesting, uh, just because the the format is. I mean, he, here's what I'd like to lead into. I'm noticing that people are either trying to go the opposite way, like this, very calm and collected, or like President Obama trying to do a little bit of Trumpiest stuff. <laughs> Obama can't do it. Yeah, but he's trying. He's trying to get mad, and he's trying to you know, yeah. Well, he yell. You have the stammering clip about the caravan? Yeah, I, I, let me see how long mine is. Uh, let me see. Uh, where do I have it here? Oh, yeah. Uh, this is He's in Wisconsin, which is, of course, very important. Um, yeah, it's, it's exactly the same, same length. Mine's a little but longer. We have the same clip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but let's this just... This is Ob- yeah. Obama. And it's actually the first time I saw this, I didn't have, I just, somebody said, look at this. And I looked at it, but I didn't, I never turned the sound on because I was just watching him. Mm-hmm. And he looks like he's, un, I mean, seriously unglued. Yeah. He is freaky looking. He's, he's, his hair is like, you know, turned almost half gray. And he's, he just doesn't look healthy. He looks terrible. And, and when he does this bit here, he has no prompter and he's just going shooting off the cuff. And, and we know what happens when he, when he's shooting off the cuff, he starts yeah, to stutter. Yeah. He stutters. Yeah. So here All he right. is in Wisconsin, which is, you know, uh, is now claimed as the, that was the state, the only 70,000 votes in Wisconsin. So he's trying to rile everybody. I think there's only a thousand people maybe in the audience. What well, didn't seem like a huge crowd. Oh, I hate no, a thousand a people crowd. of anything is pretty big. And he, and I think he's really trying to do a little bit of, you know, Trump uh, energy. That, that's, the, that's the thing that, that is the most important thing in this election. Not health care, not, not uh, you know, whether or not folks are, are able to retire, not, not you know, doing something about higher wages or rebuilding our roads and bridges and putting people back to work. <laughs> I thought it was about he's just spouting off. I think we have. And by some, the way, yeah, where was he during his eight years and so far as building, rebuilding roads and, and bridges? <laughs> but I'd like he was a, in president for eight years. Where are these roads and bridges? Don't you remember when he started off shovel ready? Yeah. He's gonna have all these shovel ready, <laughs> shovel ready, ready jobs. Yeah, shovel ready jobs. Yeah, and, then, no and, then the, and then the and then the banks anything. got all the money. <laughs> oh, silly us. Um, but yes, suddenly he's also, uh, where, why aren't you getting jobs? Well, it seems like we do have more jobs, but okay. It's this group of folks. It's just, now it's not, notice how it goes from asylum seekers, people very sad, trying to get away from, from certain death in their country, which is what we've been told. It's like these people are running for, for their lives. They, for this want a better life. And now he's diminishing them. Just putting people back to work. Suddenly it's this group of folks. We don't even know where they are. They're way down there. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. <laughs> and you know, as soon as the election's over, everybody will be like, what? What, what, what happened? We were being invaded. Where, where'd it go? <laughs> yeah. And you know what? It would be funny, except they do it every time, and too often it works. Everybody gets all freaked out, and we got to stop falling for this stuff. We we're like Charlie Brown with the football. <laughs> yes. You can't fall for that okey doke. Don't be hoodwinked. Don't be. Oh 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 I love we can bring our old songs back now. Yeah, the okie doke. The okie doke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Wait, there was something else in there. Oh, yes. He says Lucy in the football. And this is this was interesting to me. Well, he just says Charlie Brown. Uh, uh, Charlie Lucy. Brown with the football. Because I was reading. Let me see. Let me see where this is. 
there was an article that I got to uh, an article from 1990 about Trump. And let me see where it is. Uh, I'm not quite sure. It was, it, 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 I was led to it from some other article from, uh, from last year. And it's, uh, it's around the time when, you know, he's got Marla Maples is just coming into his life. The casino is going down. There's all this stuff happening. And it, it's a very, it's a vanity fair, actually. So there's, you know, big, big piece, you know, about all the grandeur and his rise to, to power and how everyone loves him and the rap stars. And then how all of a sudden he had this horrible uh, bankruptcy and he comes right back and, and the media just was all over him. And at the end of the, uh, of the article, and this is why I'm a little pissed. I can't find it that easily. Um, it actually says that so he, the the press is waiting for him at the court in the in the press room at the courthouse for one of his many pieces of litigation, and the journalists are there yelling at each other. I can't believe it. We let the, we we built this guy. We gave him all the publicity, and now he's screwing us. Ah, we hate this guy. I'm like, it's a complete fractal. They've already <laughs> gone through this one. Oh, that's actually what I filed it under fractal. There you go. It's Donald and Ivana Trump's divorce. The full story. Let me just read the last the last uh, paragraph to you, so I get it. It's a very long article. Um, here it is. I wandered down to the pre- the the writer, uh, the interviewer. I wandered down to the press room on the fifth floor to hear about Trump's testimony. The reporters sounded weary. They had heard it all before. Quote, God damn it, one shouted at me. We created him. We bought his bullshit. He was always phony, and we filled our papers with him. <laughs> They've done it before. It's, a, it's, his, it's his playbook. Fractal. It's total. Uh, do I have the fractal thing? I, don't know, I haven't used that in so long. Oh, yeah, it is a fractal. It's a good catch. It's a, well, I thought of you when I read that. Like, holy crap, they've been down this road with him. It's a fractal. Ah. Uh, now, just Can't staying on wrong. this for one second, Scaramucci, the Scaramooch, was on Bill, yeah, Bill Maher Friday. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, this, this show was actually was interesting to watch. He had Stormy Daniels on. He didn't ask anything of any importance except at the end said, you, you did something important for the country. Like, <laughs> it's, it's worthy watching just for that one quote from Bill Maher. But Scaramucci is on promoting his uh, his book. So Scaramucci for eleven days was the press secretary for Trump, and now this is a couple minutes. This and clip. I believe his sole purpose to be there was to get rid of Rance Priebus. Came very, in as a hatchet man. Oh, very possible. Now, what he is going to do in this clip? I mean, he was really, of course, the odd man out. You got Max Boot, uh, who's on the panel along with uh, Betsy Woodruff, who's from the Daily Beast. She's she's frightening. She's just like. Shoo. Just ice cold, just piking points and grimacing and oh, eye rolling. And then you got Mar, and then uh, so, and, and Scaramucci. And Scaramucci is desperate. Well, he's on the panel? He's on the panel. Oh, so that's he, different. He's outnumbered, so he's really outnumbered. But what he's, nice. trying, what he's trying to do is explain to Bill Maher in particular, but to everyone in the panel, what Trump is doing with the media when it comes to lies. And so, you know, and there's this whole lead in which I had left off of Bill Maher reading all the lies. And, you know, everyone's getting like, he lies, he lies, he just lies. He's such a liar. Thousands of lies, so many lies. And Scaramucci the whole time is trying, well, let me, let me just explain what, let me just explain what's happening. So, because you're, you know, and he actually says, you'll hear it in this clip, I, if you want to beat him, listen to me. Do you think they listen, by the way? No, it's an incredibly important point here to to refute what Anthony's trying to say here, which is that, you know, somehow politicians lie and he maybe lies a little bit more. No, this is off the charts lying. This is a blizzard That's of bullshit. Point. He has on the, on the inside of the country. It was a no of bullshit. Let, me just, let me just finish the point. By the way, in all of these shows, there's a real problem that they're going to have to address pretty soon. You cannot produce a television show where after everything someone says, which is pretty much all virtue signaling, you get 15 seconds of applause. It's annoying as a viewer. It ha- they have to figure something out because it's, 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 it makes the clip twice as long. Quickly here, because a lot of p- politicians lie a little bit. For Donald Trump, lying is the default mode. According to the Washington Post, he lies an average of eight times a day. If he tells the truth, it's an accident, okay? Uh, it's, uh, it's, you're, you're missing, you're missing the strategy, right? so that's... You know, like, so calling him out on it, 
is a lot like being the hall monitor uh, in the elementary school, calling them out on it, just like elementary you know, schools need hall so, monitors. So, so yeah, but, we should but all in America want to listen because I could really help you. You, you obviously uh, want to beat the guy, right? Yes. Okay, so if you want to listen, I can actually provide okay. some insight. Go ahead. Okay? Me, so babe. what he is doing is he is galvanizing his base. He has figured out that by mechanizing these words the way he has and getting you upset and Max upset and having 10 people at CNN read the lies, and I think the Washington Post has them with the 6,000 lies. Let's say it's 10,000 lies. It's okay. record-breaking anyway. Okay, let's say it's 50,000. Let me, let me make the point and say it's 50,000. What he's doing is he's got the volume up on something and he's made it a calculated bet that the people that are voting for him don't care about that, and he's made a Calculated bet. Why? I said right, but uh, okay, I mean, but, but what is but, the but, so okay, what but, is the alternative? That, if you're saying said, don't so call him out on the lie, what did he, what did he say in the 60 what? Minutes thing? He said all of that doesn't matter. But, we, we won and they lost. What did he say? I get that, but what you're, is the alternative right. to not calling out lies? We all live in a world where we're pretending what the Mad King sees is no. we all see. No, no, no. If no, he no, says no, the sky is purple, it. we don't call him out on that because it'll upset him. What's the strategy? Okay to call him out on it, but you see how upset you're getting right now there's a group of people I should in the be upset everybody should be upset <laughs> he's not getting it these people are upset, these people are upset. there's a lot of people in the country that feel they haven't gotten a fair shake from their government and so they, if you call them out for the lies people okay. think you're not being right, fair you know what, is that what you're, you're going to lose and, again and here's, 20, and here's what's really so important though here's what's really important again. though there's you're going to lose again and when you and when you invite well, me back after the election and he's won again I, i'll explain to you what he did to you you've explained it but it's not really advancing no, the argument. at some point no, you don't, at some you don't point like in the, next, the explanation at, but that's the strategy and it's no, working at, now this this uh this woman's going to say something but it's another minute but i I couldn't really take her out because of context, but she's annoying. At some point in the next worked. two years, there's going to be a national crisis. There's going to be some sort of mass casualty event or recession or economic disaster. And the American people will need to know that someone in a position of authority is telling them authority? things that are true. <laughs> and every time the president tells a ridiculous, mythological, mag- magical, nonsensical lie, yes, there's a, there's a defense that you can make from sort of this political Machiavellian perspective. But in the long term, for this country, it's laying the groundwork okay, for chicken little really argument. All right, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. going to bring out Jonathan. I, no, he's going to wrap it up. Gonna gonna little little and argument. it's going to help. Say what? He said, if you notice, uh, Mooch comes in and says that's a chicken little chicken argument. little argument. Exactly. We'll answer the question you're asking, and you're going to like the second half of the show probably a little really more than ask, you like the first. I'm not asking a question. I'm, I'm trying to explain you what he's doing okay. to you, and you're very animated about it, and a lot of people like that. Maybe not these people, but there's a large group of people in middle America that like I'm animated because being we can't, animated. We, we we can't be animated even, about this assault yes, on truth, and, Anthony. And we can't even really no, see. You know it what? seems there's like we can't. strategy, Max, and I can actually give you the playbook. I, I know. Uh, you keep and, saying and the same thing. Open, but we're not having the same conversation. Right. Okay. No, so let's bring that's out sure. Jonathan. It's, it's okay. We're in a different, it's we're in two different levels. We're like, it's that's like every. So Mooch is trying to say, Trump, the whole idea is he riles everybody up. And and his supporters love watching you blow your top. And he's blowing his top as he's saying that this is dumb. It's very funny. That's one of the really, I, that's an outstanding borderline clip of the day. Now, Mooch did a good job on that, I thought. Now, to back, to back up that clip, I have the John Stewart on Trump, ah. where he, where he explains explains what Trump is doing to journalists. Yes, and this again, is, nobody's really paying much attention. This is uh, Christian Amantour, and I think he's doing a thing over in uh, London with uh, Dave Chappelle. They're doing some right. kind of just comedy special. Soaking it in, in this in this clip. So do you think, because obviously we're all caught up in this sort of daily Trump fest. I mean, every uh, single newspaper, every radio station, every bit of social media. You got to make money, or, too. Well, it's you got, dissecting. You got, you got bills to pay, man. You got electric bills. You got food. You know, this guy is he's giving you all cash, the cash flow in the Trump era for uh for these TV stations and for these... Can, can I say, that might have been an issue, and yeah. maybe it still is an issue for the people who are the bean counters, but we, yeah. the journalists, we, I think, believe that our job is to navigate the truth and to do the fact-checking and all the rest of it. So I think that's what motivates people. But I think the people. journalists have taken it personally. Okay, They're that's personally wounded and offended by this man. He baits them, and they dive in. And what he's done well, I thought, is appeal to their own narcissism. 
to their own ego. Because what he says is these are the, and the journalists stand up and say, we are noble, we are honorable, how dare you, sir? And they take it personally. And now he's changed the conversation to not that his policies are silly or not working or any of those other things. It's all about the fight. He's, he's able to tune out everything else and get people just focused on the fight. He's going to win that fight. You know, even um, Bob, Bob Woodward said that in his book on the, on the Trump White House that a lot of journalists are too emotional about this. But it's hard for us to be dispassionate when words from the White House mm-hmm. are aggressive against us and, 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 and you know, raise the spectrum well, you're not of violence used to it. against think us. Of the communities no, no, we're used of, to it, believe but me. think of the communities We've been of out there color. In the field. Think of Muslims. <laughs> think of oh, yeah. uh, the, the black community. You know what, you know what, you know what he's doing? What, what's happening right Right here is John Stewart is explaining identity politics as it pertains to journalists. He's saying, and he does. I don't think he realizes it, but the identity politics, of primarily the Democrat Party, is speaking to LGBTQ community, speaking to the people of color community, speaking to the Latino community, speaking to all these different communities, and now he's literally putting the journalists into a politically identified group as. as- as a uh, hardcore victim, victim. Democrat, this would be natural to him. <laughs> Aggressive against us, and 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 you know, raise the spectrum. But you're not violence used to it. Think us. of the communities. No, no, we're used of, to it. Believe but me. Think of the communities We've been of out there color. In the field. Think of Muslims. Think of uh, the, the, the black community. People. You know, when journalists rise to this outrage of how dare you say this about us? Think of the lives that they've been leading under this, and and All right. what they've been put under. Yeah, I think it's ident- uh, identity politics. Now, he says a number of things in there that's, that I find to be quite interesting. Uh, but I re- I'm reminded of the early uh, Trump campaign before he actually was running, but he was starting the run, or maybe it's right after he came down the escalator. Wait, is that when he said all Mexicans are rapists? <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. that, that's when he did because say Because that. that, by the way, is repeated every day. It's not even oh, yeah. questioned. Yeah, nobody cared. That's not a lie. No, that's not a lie. No, not at all. So – but that's but anyway, I remember him being interviewed down in that inside the Grand Central Hyatt with by Katie Turr. Oh, yeah. And he insulted her. I, yes. We had the clip. He insulted her a number of times. He says, well, you know, you're not doing a very good job. at It's not the right kind of you want me to help you help you ad, answer these ask these questions because you don't apparently don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> and then within. Within a, and I think she did, from there on, she just held a grudge and she couldn't oh, get yeah. it out of her craw. Oh, yeah. And then, then I the next time we saw it, that we exploited it on, where we exploited it hey, on wait, the was show. It, was this? Uh, let's see. Was it Katie Tur unloads on Trump over violence at rallies? No, this no this this was the result. Before, uh, I don't I don't think you can find that. Other oh clip. wait, uh, Katie Tur versus Trump. Maybe. Let's play it. It says part three, so let's see what this is. For months of flying under the radar and refusing to comment on Trump, Rubio is no. now attacking, perhaps smelling blood no, no, in no, the no. water. That's on not, Trump. not it. No. Okay. All right. Now, but, anyway, the next one that happened that we put on the show was Major Garrett, who yes. also had this huge hard on for Trump after this. He insulted him. He says, you know, you maybe should do your job a little better or something, just some minor thing. But you could see that Garrett was in, insulted. And these journalists are actually the ones who are thin skinned. And I think Stuart <laughs> yes. nailed it. Yes. <laughs> I think he nailed it. These yes. guys are all biting at the, uh, chomping at the bit to like, you know, do, get back at Trump and, and they're, instead of doing their job. And that's what we <laughs> kind of our show is about doing their job for them. And uh, you're right. Stuart nails it. He says the way that these people must feel, bec- and of course, they feel that way because of what the victimization that's being pumped into them. Mainly from uh, Democrat politicians, you know that. Uh, yeah, that's hurtful, and so that's what it's like with you guys, and you're not realizing that. Even though he said the fake news is enemy of the people, it is now boiled down to: Do you have a press card? You might as well have a target on your head. And by the way, it was the media itself that you know they're worried about Trump's lies, but they're the ones. They're the ones, it's the media that turned it from fake news as the enemy yes, of the people, in, which is in, what he said. In true fake news fashion. <laughs> and they, and they, the media in general, didn't like that so much they wanted to be the enemy of the people because they're the ones who changed it. They, there's not <laughs> they a, wanted there's, to be the victim. They wanted to be the victim. There's not one journalist that doesn't know that's a lie. Hey, hey, he hey, never hey. said that. 
So they want to be the victim, and now they're they're, they're reaping the they're the victim. The victim is always put upon. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, fake news. Fake news. But they uh, so. So, Stuart, I I think we always sense this kind of thing. But I'm glad Stuart said this because I don't think we fully realize the the horror that these people have put themselves up for. Themselves, themselves. Themselves. To listen to Scaramucci lecture them and them get worked up right in front of your very <laughs> eyes. It's, it's, it's an eye opener. It's beautiful. Now, we have this guy that I don't remember his name, but he came on Jake Tapper's show, I believe. And Tapper says, yes, 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 to everything he said. This is a clip that's been going around. Another example of a guy who is completely off the deep end, trying to hold it together. He's an analyst, I believe. I don't have his name here. Uh, and he starts going on it in, in this very long clip. It's 218. You can kill it if you think it's boring. But. He gives all the talking points that the Democrats are starting to use. And one of them, which is in here, and I've heard it, it was just done by one of the commentators on CNN. It's done by, which people have clipped for me. There's a bunch of people saying it. Trump is worse than ISIS. Yes, we know that. It's on the rotation. He's, making, he's, he's using ISIS, ISIS tactics to radicalize the public in general. You know, the, the right wing machine is somehow radicalizing uh -huh. everybody yes. into ISIS. Mm -hmm. And to even use that as a comparison, you have to be so hard up. And again, you're talking about Trump. Talk about issues. Talk about the roads. Do something else. But no, no, they're going to go. This, this is the direction the Democrats are going. What we Talk are seeing, just as we saw young, displaced, evil or sick or just plain losers be radicalized by ISIS. Is evil actually the term evil on the rotation list? I have a feeling. I don't believe. I, I, I don't think Because so. I've heard this a couple of times. Evil. Yeah, but. Evil. Yeah. yeah but well, I don't think it was just. I'll, okay. look, in, I'll yes. look at it. We are seeing the same thing. In the United States right now, these two losers, these two sick people, these two evil people, three evil people being radicalized by this right wing propaganda industry. Wait, who was the third person? Oh, that, Kentucky. Oh, and that's exactly what it is. This whole caravan in the last week of the election is a giant lie. This is Trump's Reichstag fire. Yeah. It is a <laughs> lie. Nice. And that the United States military, the most powerful armed force in the world, would be deployed at a brigade size unit level to the southern border. You know, I, I just want to make one, you know, having grown up in the Netherlands, I'm very sensitive to the Nazi stuff because <clears throat> I grew up, you know, oversensitive, oversensitized to that because I... Kids I played with, uh, the grandmothers were home. They had numbers tattooed on their arms. So you know, you, this this was very this was not brought up. Uh, certainly not in this context. But there was kind of a general agreement: <clears throat> we're not going to blame the Jews for anything, but we're not going to blame the Germans or anyone else for the like Nazi stuff. And you know, you can't have it's in in Europe at least at the time. You you couldn't do that. Like this, it was like, look, we fought that war. It's done. Everyone step back from it. By the way, in that article, um, that's how I got to that article about Trump and the press. It was an article that he has a uh, a book, and this was this goes back to 1990 that he has a book of Hitler speeches next to his bed. Yeah, so they've, they've been <laughs> they've been doing this they've been doing this uh, this thing a lot. Sure, he does. And, yeah, and of course that later morphed into he has Mein Kampf next to his bed. But uh, anyway, I, I digress. But this is really unconscionable. I think it's just as bad as calling Jews out as being responsible for anything. It's, it's, it's horrible, and but yet it's passable. To stop this caravan, which is a thousand miles away and made up of women and children, the insinuations that it's filled with terrorists and Middle Easterners, 40% of the country has opted into an alternate reality. We have to wake up in this country and understand the danger that this presents to all of us. We can't put our heads in the sand. Kellyanne Conway despicably today goes on national television and she said, well, this shooter's motives were because there's an anti-religious sentiment. No, ma'am. The propaganda industry that she commands with the no, vile president that she serves, abetted by Mark Levin vile. and Rush Limbaugh <laughs> and Breitbart and Newsbusters 
and Judicial Watch and all the rest of them. Man, couldn't we get on that list? They mentioned almost everybody. Have blood on their hands oh. for the incitements <laughs> that they blood have made that have uh, triggered no. and radicalized these crazy people. It is deliberate in intent. He scapegoats minority populations. He alleges conspiracies. He creates a sense of shared and virtuous victimhood, positions himself as the avenger, and there is no cost too high yeah. so long as it benefits his narcissism, so long as it benefits him politically. Good job. Well signaled. Well. Uh, I certainly have something to say about that, uh, specifically what the cause of these people uh, doing these things is. I have some thoughts, but I'd like to first thank you for your courage and say in the morning yeah. to you, John C. Dvorak, where the C stands for Caravan of Love. <laughs> in the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry, in the morning all the ships at sea, boots on the ground, feet in the air, subs in the water, and all the dames and nights out In there. the morning to the troll room who always see the bat signal appear and they even tweet to the troll room. And we appreciate y'all showing up here. That is uh, at noagendastream.com. We love having you guys uh, keeping us company. It makes the show that much more exciting. If you do any type of podcast, uh, I would recommend... Uh, that you try and stream it live while you're recording. It is, it, the feedback loop is uh, incredibly important. It also makes you feel that you're alive, that you're doing something. You get some feedback, and it's, uh, I like it very much, and so it's appreciated. Uh, also, I want to say in the morning to Mark G, two in a row, uh, we could not, we just could, could not live without using this piece of artwork that he created for us for episode 1081. Darren, didn't Darren do the one before? No, Mark G. Okay. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, Darren did 1080. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So 1080, 1080, 1081 blakes it. And the cover art was a Warhol esque uh, depiction of Trump and got a lot of, uh, a lot of pu- discussion about this. Yeah. One. A lot of people liked it. A lot of people liked it. And we liked it too. It's fantastic. And we uh, really appreciate it. Mark G. Thank you for your courage. Uh, he uh, does some jobs karma. Com- I think he wanted jobs karma. Make sure he gets that. And uh, thanks to all of our artists who diligently are uploading art. It's it's tough sometimes to choose, but you can see all of the artwork at the noagendaartgenerator.com. And it's a part of our value network, our value for value system, which I'll just reiterate quickly. Um, we long ago decided and along the way, you know, our conviction was confirmed that there's really no way to monetize the network. The best way to, uh, you know, I think it, it, from your perspective, John, came from the book publishing model where people buy the content and uh, then they, it's, it's uh, supported by the audience. Now, we have a little different audience. They are, our audience is producers. They're actively involved with the program, sending us their, their, uh, their expertise, their uh, creative work, uh, and also financial and it's all based on what is the show worth to you. If you're getting something out of it, put something into it. Turns out when you put something into it, you usually get something out of it. Um, now, I'm not claiming that a jingle with karma can give you a job, but participating in the network has proven to work for a lot of people a lot of the time. And we also made the determination early on that because of the content that we wanted to do when we started developing the model – of uh, news deconstruction that we couldn't do it with advertising. No, because, and we've seen the example and we, we harp on the examples that we see uh, out there that where people were thrown off a network or the advertisers pulled out and the show folded or they got pressured. Well, I ran, I ran a whole network funded by venture capital money and I proved that it cannot be done. Right, that's where the brand safety <laughs> moniker comes from. By the way, it was a was a mantra there. Uh, oh, brand brand safe advertising. That means yes. you can't really produce what you want to. Yeah, uh, no cussing is what it really amounts. <laughs> to. I, I got so many notes for a different topic we'll talk about, and one of them was from naive London girl, and uh, she had a show about sex, and we had it on Pod Show UK, and I remember we had to sometimes obfuscate it from our home page because you know, like some investor would see it, and it just investors alone. And then, you know, oh, we're going on a pitch. We're going to pitch some advertising. Oh, take, take Naive London Girl off the front. Put her, put her somewhere else so they, so they don't see her because she had a big boob and stuff in her, in her album art. 
Yeah. Well, it said naive London girl on it, but you know, so yeah, it's, it, you really will never reach your potential and you're just, you continue to be a slave. This is why whenever someone says, Hey, you want to come do this, do a quick interview on this network? I'm like, no, no, because I know I'm going to get in there. I'm going to be really disappointed because it's going to be 15 seconds. You're going to ask me something completely stupid. Um, you know, and it's boring. And then we'll have to, we can't even have a discussion because it was time for an ad break. And then it's on to the next. No, I, it's, it's lame. I couldn't even do it anymore. If I, if I wanted to. So we have this model and people, uh, appreciate it. I think, especially this week on this show, 1082, Sir Woody appreciates it to the tune of a thousand dollars. Whoa. I'm afraid I've been overboard again, he writes, and not caught recent shows, but want to let you know that you're still appreciated. I recently asked to give a keynote at a conference, and your show notes were invaluable. Ah, good. Another valuable thing. That, By the way, the show notes are if you're a student. Yeah. Fantastic. Go to nashownotes.com, or if you want to search them, bingit.io. We're invaluable in helping me gather supporting links. It was unpaid, but something I enjoyed a lot and found it rewarding. So in keeping with the value for value model, I figure one dollar for each of the one thousand or show or so people that were there is a worthy contribution for your support. Hopefully this is just noise in a tsunami of donations as you certainly <laughs> deserve that for the work you do. Well, Sir Woody, you are the crest of the tsunami, my friend. Yes. Thank you tsunami. so much. That's very very I'm gonna hit him with a karma if you don't mind, because uh uh, let me see. Where's my karma bucket? Oh, there it is. You've got karma. Baron Matt in Melbourne, Australia, $333. Uh, greetings from Baron Matt in Melbourne. Happy, happy 11th anniversary. Intentionally late to buffer the donation doldrums after a big drive. Spending a couple of days in Dimension B recently. No agenda thinking. Help me to understand. Cope and even have some fun. Well, I usually find the donation karma finds its way to me regardless. I want to make sure that this one focuses on someone else. Can you send the karma from this donation in the F cancer variety to my brother-in-law, Renzo, who could really do with it? Thank you for your courage, Baron Matt in Melbourne. Yes, of course we can. You've got karma. F that cancer. Uh, F it. Well, oh, we got f- Fred. 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 Fred Van Leeuwen. Uh, no, he- no, it's Fred. Fred Van Le Van Leeuwen. No, no. Listen, Fred Van Leeuwen. Fred Van Leeuwen. Yes, very In good. Hilversum. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Fred wanted to know if there was still going to be a meetup on the seventh or the ninth of November in the Netherlands. Um, it may not happen. I was hoping to to come over but uh, i think with before the end of the year we will be able to do this i think but uh, we'll send out a bat signal when it's time we need to put together a mailing list for the for the hollanders yes yes sure. and, th- and thank you very much fred appreciate yeah, it yeah he sent it 267.89 thank you sir achilles uh 262 in noblesville indiana sir achilles sir last year i hung up the soccer cleats after rupturing both of my Achilles. Wow. Damn. In a three-year period, I decided to replace soccer with running. Uh, here's 262 in honor of me running in my first marathon, 26.2 miles on Saturday, November 3rd. I did the math and have logged over 400 miles in training over the last four months. Darn near all of those miles were spent listening to no agenda. If I could make a donation to you guys straight from my health savings account, I would. Because you guys and the chiropractor, there's no way I could have made it this far without you guys and the chiropractor. No. Mm. My son recently joined the Cub Scouts, and I have to say I'm extremely impressed with the entire program. If a listener out there is an elementary age child, I encourage you to sign them up. It is fun getting to see kids do something besides playing Fortnite and watching YouTubers play Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> How sick are we? <laughs> I want to give a shout out to my brother, Eric, since he is the only person in 11 years I have been able to hit in the mouth, but it took the 2016 election to get him hooked. I also want to give a shout out to my wife, who is woke, but sadly doesn't listen and often asks me 
with maximum disdain. Oh, what do John and Adam think about that? <laughs> no, you're not doing it right. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, yeah, what do John and Adam think about it? Maybe. Maybe. She's in a, you got the, you got the vocal fry in there. I yeah. Think I of, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you got to get, got to get some fry. Uh, hey, she's tolerating. So there's hope. There's hope. Uh, let me try it again. But you know, <laughs> but you know what it is? She's still, she's still trying to connect with her, with her man. With something that he's, she might as well say to who was the quarterback, you know, I mean, if she uh, doesn't care about, uh, yeah, all right. Uh, uh, what do John and Adam uh, think about that? <laughs> she's an, that's more of a boring person. Yeah, Never she's mind. an amazing that. spouse that without her, the marathon wouldn't <laughs> be possible. So we're, yes. we're just joking around, of course. Yeah, she's we're great. just joking around. If possible, can I get a Stay Woke Karma for the run and the Night Me Baby song? By the way, she doesn't listen to the show, so she's not going to hear that. Night Me Baby song, Night Me Baby, with a talented producer that a talented producer wrote based on my nighting email last year. Thanks for 11 great years. I'm so glad I thought John was funny on Cranky Geeks and looked for more of his stuff back in 2007. Night Me Baby. I've been an awful good slave Not me, baby Not me on a podcast tonight My millennials, stay woke You've got karma Nailed it Uh, That was Sir Achilles in Noblesville, Indiana 262 Sir Finch in Corvallis, Oregon Two, three, four, five, six. And he sent a note. Uh, he's a, he wrote it longhand. Very, very. And he's a, he needs uh, to take some pen, not penmanship, but I would say uh, calligraphy. I was going to give you one, 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 one for your 11th. But since PayPal glitched three times while trying to c- complete the donation, I figured I'd, I'd up the amount to a producer level. Always happy 11th anniversary. Love you guys. Thanks for the laughs and the sanity. Title change, which we do have. Ah, yes, we have changes that. Changes complex name to a more simple name. Uh-huh. Cheers to 11 more. We'll keep this short and sweet since my hand is cramping. Oh, <laughs> but he did it. Yeah, he did. No jingles, no karma. All right. Good. Thank you very much for your courage. Uh, Andrew Cantrell in Womberall, New South Wales, Australia, two, three, two, two, seven, three, one. Uh, a great email. Well, do you, did you get it? Go ahead, Johnny. You can find it. <laughs> do you have it yet? I'm, I know. I just opened it. <laughs> you got 20 seconds. He's doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the new old is new again. You want mail? You got squirrel mail. Do you have it? I have two notes from Andy Cantrell. <laughs> one from May 22nd, 2018, and one from May 27th, 2018, and there's nothing after that. Oh, damn. Well, I was too busy playing the music. I should guess I should look. Who are we looking for? It's yours. Check it out. Uh, and you don't have squirrel mail, so you can't play the music. <laughs> no, I wish. I'm not. I'm just not. I woke, I'm not woke enough. Let me see. Well, Andrew sent us a note, another note. We'll read it when you, when you can, uh, when it comes through. No, I'm sorry. I, I see that. I see that he, he, he shows up in a lot of donation uh, notes for sure, but not uh, not a new one. Uh, onward to Montana, May in Blacklick, Ohio. Second on my list to Nawbone as a great city's name. Uh, she wrote a note in. Uh, which I my reading glasses and put them aside for the squirrel mail thing. Uh, John and Adam. Uh, and by the way, her donation was two, 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 which is one, 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 one times two. I'm a first time donor. So I believe a de douching oh, is an order. order. Yes. <laughs> You've been de douched. I'm requesting some research karma for my smoking hot boyfriend. He is a longtime listener who donates via an anonymous monthly subscription. He turned me onto the show six months ago when we first started dating. Needless to say, I've been hooked oh. since. Woo-hoo! 
Like most <laughs> other note writers, you provide me with some awesome sanity keeping news analysis, which prevents me from burying my head in the sand to stay sane. <laughs> it works. Anyway, he is a hardworking PhD chemistry candidate who is on his way to a national lab to finish his five and a half year venture. Maybe some karma from the good folks at the No Agenda will keep everything, will help everything fall into place. Also, congrats, Adams, uh, Adam, on the engagement. Thank you. I thought the proposal was on point. Thank you. It is, if it's not pushing my requesting luck, please play the Fomer clip. Oh. <laughs> Nothing so simple has given me as many laughs as Fomer boy losing it. Thank you, and uh, keep up the amazing work. Best, Montana Maid. Oh, my God! Woo! Listen to that horn! <laughs> You've got karma. Did you, did you see uh, Dame Tanya tweeted? She was getting on the, on the train with the observation deck. Yeah. You've, you've created a whole new foamer of, out of her. <laughs> Good. Dame, Dame Fomer Tanya. Yeah, and she tweeted, Oh, my God, listen to that horn! <laughs> it's, it's taken on a life of its own. People are starting to appreciate the yes. great railways of the past and the current. Yes. And New York's got lots of trains you can take every which way. Yes. Uh, commuters mostly, but there's still trains. Uh, that was Montana. Uh, John Clen, I think Clenny or Clen, K L E N E, in Cincinnati, Ohio. 200 bucks, no jingles, no karma. And that wraps up our executive and associate executive producer segment for show 1082. Yes. And thank you all so much. These credits, as always, are real. So if you're an executive producer or an associate executive producer, you can uh, put that anywhere credits are recognized. And you are the executive producer of episode 1082 of the No Agenda Show, best podcast in the universe. If anyone questions you, let us know. We'll gladly vouch for you. And I uh, look forward to thanking more people, $50 and above, in our second segment, another show on the way on Sunday. Please remember us at Dvorak.org. Slash N A. Yeah, we're helping you keep your sanity, so why don't you go out there and propagate the formula? Our formula is this we go out, we hit people in the mouth. Shut up, slave. Shut up, slave. I, um, so I want to talk for a second about, you know, people. You know, going crazy, and they're on the social media, and they're killing people, and and this came to a head with the uh, Squirrel Hill uh, synagogue shooter, uh, and we discussed it. I think as we were talking about it on Sunday, um, Gab dot AI was it Gab dot IO or Gab Gab the social network Gab? Yeah, Gab was uh, as they call it, no platformed, uh, which includes taking. Them, you know, it's basically it's it's the cabal of uh, technology where you have your you know you have all your little bits and bobs and you have your DNS and you know if your DNS provider because it's so outrageous that they would provide DNS lookup for you because you know I don't know you're associated with Jew haters and whatever else the media throws on you and killers and crazy people and just nut jobs. Uh, so they'll they'll say, oh, we're not going to provide that for you. And then you're where your hosting provider and then PayPal. And so uh, these guys basically got uh, wiped out. And, uh, you know, I, I would say the no matter what you do, if you have anything centralized and certainly if if their model is not advertising, but if your model is advertising, there's there's a lot of problems. But first, I want to just hear NPR talking about Gab after the synagogue attack. Gab is a site that proudly promotes free speech. It boasts that it lets anyone say anything, but it's been controversial. And I do want to point out that in this interview they did with uh, uh, the founder of Gab, he posted the whole, you know, it's very typical. They called, you know, this woman actually called him. He recorded the whole conversation. It was about 15 minutes. And most of what he was saying is, you know, we adhere strictly to the First Amendment. So if you incite hate, where you know, if someone reports it, we we take you down. But you know, we're not policing everything, and you know, it, only if it comes to you know a reportable uh, event, uh, then uh, then we'll take that down. And we've worked uh, tirelessly with law enforcement. We have a whole record of this guy. We gave everything. None of that is in the interview 
Of course. Critics have called it a home for anti-Semites and white nationalists. Robert Bowers was a... I like that unattributed critics. That's pretty, that's pretty nasty when I think about it. Critics have nah. called it a home for white nationalists. Well, could you tell me one critic maybe? Who calls it that? Or do you have someone there? Semites and white nationalists. Robert Bowers was a user. Before allegedly going on a killing spree, he posted about the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, a group that supports refugees. He said the group, quote, likes to bring invaders that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics. I'm going in. Andrew Torba is the CEO of Gab. In an interview with NPR, he defended the platform. I, I don't know. Do you see a direct threat in there? Because I don't. What, what would you expect us to do with a post like that? Would, would you, you want us to just censor anybody that says the phrase, I'm going in? Is that what you're proposing here? Well, I think, I think that's, that's absurd. Funny. And here's the thing. The answer to bad speech or hate speech, however you want to define that, is more speech. And it always will be. When does online free speech become a threat? This isn't the first time the issue has come up in social media. Just last week, it came to light that the man accused of sending explosive devices to prominent Democrats in the media had a history of threatening tweets. Torba says Gab follows strict rules, including no threats. He says he created Gab because he saw no room for conservative points of view on social media. Take Twitter. Twitter. There are thousands upon thousands of people calling for someone to kill Donald Trump, saying they're going to kill Donald Trump, uh, expressing hate towards white people, towards Christians, towards minorities who may uh, now support Donald Trump. Uh, They allow hate to be spewed at certain groups and certain people. So where is the line between free speech and inciting violence? I think the line is where free speech becomes a threat. Kelly McBride is a senior vice president at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies. She says Torba is prioritizing free speech above all other constitutional values. And that is not necessarily what our constitutional framers intended, right? They didn't want the government curbing free speech. Nor did they want citizens to be irresponsible with their speech, she says. Last year, Google banned Gab's app. Mm. Apple rejected it, and Microsoft terminated its agreement with it last month. I didn't even know all that was going on. Just in the last 24 hours, at least two web hosting platforms have suspended Gab. CEO Andrew Torba is not backing down. We're not going anywhere. Torba says Gab (laughs) condemns the shooting, but he thinks it's now being targeted unfairly. Over the weekend, the social media site was filled with anger. Some of it directed at the Jewish community. Ah, (laughs) Great. So Gab uh, is immediate because it's for free speech is immediately uh, alt-right Jew haters, you know, crazy, crazy people. And a lot of a lot of what is going on is blamed on President Trump and you know the rhetoric. But I, I think I've I'm developing a theory and I, I want your feedback on it, John, because I am um, putting a lot of things together. And it really started uh, a couple days ago. There was this, I don't know if it was a tweet or someone said, hey, check and see if you're shadow banned. And, you know, and of course, we've talked about shadow banning. I'm like, well, let me see what this is. So, I, And I didn't have to enter my password or make it an app or anything. Uh, I just entered your Twitter username. And, it, and I couldn't understand the results that were coming back. It was like one of those, you know, hosted at a in a tilde slash directory on someone's university account. You know what I mean? Where it's a basically dot htm almost. So very, it's like a Perl script running somewhere. And uh, what it was spinning back was not chat. Every, it had a number of posts, like the last 10 posts, not shadow banned, but then had stuff that would say um, six people saw it, three people saw it, you know, then 130%. Very odd. And it dawned on me, I finally figured out what was happening, what this so-called shadow banning is. Um, This is really the algorithm that Twitter uses, and I'm going to assert that it's the same algo that Facebook uses. Uh, Now, there's no algo on, for instance, Reddit, and the algorithm on um, Instagram is a little different. But when it comes to pure, and I'm just going to keep it Twitter to make it easy. What the algorithm does is if you post a tweet and let's say you get eight 
responses. The so-called shadow banning is really what the replies are coming back, which if you look at your Twitter timeline, everything is kind of the same weight and design. You know, it's like tweets kind of are as big as your own original tweet. The algorithm is deciding which of the replies it's going to surface. So, you know, you'll see your original tweet and it's like a reply and then there may be seven more underneath there. But And so this is where kind of this, oh, I got shadow banned. You know, I'm trying to tweet to you, but it's you're not seeing it. People aren't seeing it. This is what the actual algo does. And it makes sense, you know, coming from the RSS world, I was a part of that very early on and, you know, and everyone had Google Reader and, you know, you could, with your blogs, go back and forth, but people weren't freaking out on each other. I mean, this goes back to Usenet, if I may be so bold as to raise that. Um, Usenet, there was a lot of, of vitriol, a lot of hate, you know, there was a lot of moderation, a lot of, and this is where uh, Goodwin's Law came from. From from the old Godwin. God, I'm sorry, Godwin's law, the old bulletin boards, but it was not the same nuttiness that we're seeing on Twitter. And um, I I was reading an article about if you remember the that Microsoft they had that Thai or Tay the AI chatbot that it was on on the web for 24 right, that hours. Was, that was recently, yeah. Yeah, 24 hours, and then they had to take it down because all it was doing was tweeting like, you know, Hitler was right, you know, kill all the Jews, yeah, and just in, insane stuff. But the, here's here's what I think I understand about what's going on. The uh, And in fact, here's what they say. Microsoft said, the AI chatbot Tay is a machine learning project designed for human engagement. As it learns, some of its responses are inappropriate and in, and indicative of the types of interactions some people are having with it. We're making some adjustments to Tay, and the thing never came back. Because I believe that this magical algorithm that is used for engagement, so <clears throat> let's understand that on Twitter, the algorithm has one job. And, and because we know the goal, we can reverse engineer what's going on. The goal is to create inventory. Every single time you click on something, a new page or something appears, but it really is an advertising inventory. Do you, you agree with that? I'm not going to disagree with it. Well, so the algorithm doesn't I know. Mean, what I think you're doing is you're taking ownership of Twitter, and this is how you you reverse engineering something to make money. This is what you how you do it. Yeah, and, and this, of course, is the fallacy. This is the problem with Twitter is because of their model. Their model is advertising. Advertising needs inventory. It needs what they call engagement. So engagement is created by the algorithm. How does the algorithm do it? It doesn't know what you don't like. It only knows what you have clicked on, and it takes that as a one. It's only really only a one or a zero. Maybe one day with, with the, when they tr- flip on your webcam, they can see what part of the page you're looking at, and you looked at it, but you didn't click on it. But they really don't. Just like Tay, all they have is what the user is giving it. The algo's entire job is to find something else that will make you click it, thinking you like it. But here's the thing. Just like Tay, we as humans, we get off. I mean, it's physiologically proven. I don't have to you know, dredge up what, social, what scientists are saying about um, all kinds of pulses you get and all kinds of dopamine hits when you get something. Making something pissed off, whether it's a person or whether it's a chat bot, is what we love. We can't help ourselves. We're anonymous. It's kind of the ultimate game. You know, what's on the line? Well, your job, your reputation, your friends, your family, with whatever you say, it's kind of risky to go on there, but you can make, just like what um, Scaramouche was saying, the whole idea is to piss the other side off. And so the, 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 the algorithm doesn't understand, it has no, do you, when someone says, oh, it's machine learning, bullshit. It doesn't have emotions. It doesn't understand what anger is. You know, it has no idea. All it's doing is just, oh, you want this? I'm giving you more of that, giving you more of that. Now, when this takes place, it, I mean, to me, it should be labeled like alcohol because social networks are fine. And I don't know what Gab was doing, if they had an, uh, an algorithm or not. Doubtful. Um, so, you know, like uh, No Agenda Social is just a straight up, you know, re- reverse chronological order feed. And yeah. there's, there's no there's nothing there to try and give you stuff to make you post more because you're pissed off. So when this happens and this is what uh, Professor Ted Kaczynski said, there's this over socialization that takes place. And this is also part of the swearing. I'm noticing more people on the left saying fuck 
And the reason why is it they need to let something out. When you say, fuck, I mean, I can feel it. You know, your, your, your pupils get dilated, your pores open up. There's a whole physiological thing that happens. And it's a release of tension. That's why they're doing it. So we're so over-socialized, you can't say anything. And then you just start yelling at each other. The algo keeps just keeps spinning it up, spinning it up. And at a certain point, you pop off. And you go nuts, and I guarantee you we're going to see a lot more of it. And I'm not against algorithms. We can't stop what's going on. But it should at least be labeled as dangerous to your health. Because it, it, this, this is what's creating the violence in real life. Is the algorithm on advertising-based social networks. Because you don't hear someone from Reddit necessarily getting all nuts. You don't hear... now. Uh, Instagram also has an algorithm, but they have designed it differently where the context is a picture and the comments, sure, there can be 5,000 comments of people yelling, but it doesn't show up in your feed. It only shows a few. It's hidden. It's much smaller. It's down below. That thing is an advertiser's dream. That's working very well. You don't hear people from Instagram going killing people. No, it's Twitter or Facebook. And I'm convinced they, this algorithm is bull crap. Is just as stupid. They don't. They can't make it any better. The machine doesn't know and has no incentive to give you calm, calm and collected, lovely stuff. No, that's not what we want. Okay, well, I, I think these guys are on drugs. Well, there's a reason why Twitter limits their characters to uh, now it's 240. They don't want to give anybody too much supply. You well, got, with uh, Facebook, you can r- run into those long posts, right. which you used to read. And I wish somebody would provide us with some of these posts because you're not going to go back. Uh, you know what it reminds me? I, you know what reminds Sorry to interrupt. Do you remember Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson's yeah. book about the metaverse? Yeah. And it was very analogous to today. When did it came out in the 90s, I think? <clears throat> and the metaverse was this this network and instead of getting on a web browser you put on your vr goggles and it was you know rendered and she were in there and the only people on the street were delivery for domino's pizza because they won the franchise wars and uh electric hoverboards very analogous to the damn scooters we got everywhere and everyone's in these networks in these rooms but then you could you could uh get too much of it and then you got this drug they actually called it, it was kind of a drug which was some code and then people would actually freak out in real life in front of their screens. They would either freeze or die or go do something crazy. And it was called Snow Crash. And I think this is what's happening in a way. People are, it's in their heads. They have nowhere to go. They can't say anything. They, they go over, start, they, they, then they just like swearing. Some people are susceptible. Oh, by the way, throw in some Adderall, some other uh, amphetamine or meth products. You got, you got a great combination here. Uh, thanks for that enlightening analysis. <laughs> so death is right around the corner for everybody. <laughs> We're all doomed. We're for everybody. Die. Exactly. So um, Hillary Clinton. Uh, everyone saw the video of her being racist. Uh, do we have to talk about this? Yes, I do. And I, I'm not going to say we shouldn't talk about it, but I, I think you and I are in agreement. Well, I'd like to play this. I, I, if you can make it short, I'd just like to play it in context for everybody because that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. Yeah, play it. All right. So this is uh, this is what she actually said and how the conversation. Well, well, wait, wait, stop. We got to have some background. That's what I want to do. But you want me to make it short, no, 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 so I'm, I'm rushing no, along I'm, now. Me set up, set up, set up. Mm-hmm. Let me set it up. Hillary Clinton said to somebody casually, uh, "Oh, it's because all blacks look alike." So the right wing went crazy. And everybody's pointing the finger at her as being a racist hypocrite. Also, it was, though, it, was, it was clipped out of context. Yeah, it was clipped. But so we'll play the whole thing, and then we'll mention that, geez, you know, if you're going to have one guy on one side that's just joking, clowning around constantly, saying stuff like this, why don't they give Hillary the same break? She does have a, a sense of humor. And, and, and this, now these are two women who know each other very well. They... Uh, in fact, just a uh, was it here? Was that a, I wanted just a quickie? Uh, did I? Oh yeah, here it is. 
this is just at the very beginning before they were started, just to give to set the scene as to what this crowd is about and who was who was hooting and hollering in the it's audience. Kara Swisher. Okay, yeah, Kara Swisher from uh, Rico Deco. I, I, I take it seriously, and it's going to take a while to work through um, our families and our workplaces, our societies. Yeah, it's hard. I have two sons, and they tried to drive me off the sidewalk the other day because <laughs> they own the sidewalk, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> you know? and you found yourself on the edge, right? Right, yeah. and then I shoved the crap out of them. <laughs> As you know, my theory that all men should be raised by lesbians and then moved back to the general population. Um, Such good men. And they're really good at sports then. Okay. um, So are the Democrats... So, you know, she hates her own boys because they have penises. (laughs) She said it. I shove them away. They got to teach these kids, these horrible little boys. Well, I mean, this to me was actually more... In a subtly offensive yes, way, offensive. Yes, yes, I agree. Than what Hillary said, but okay. Well, let's care. So, but here's slide. two people who know each other. They're joking, and Hillary is clearly making a joke about Donald Trump, uh, who would be racist. And these two, they they meet, they talk, they've talked before. So when you hear it all in context, you understand that it's a joke. But she does say something weird, but, which was but, what? I was going to say. Do you think they kiss? I, 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 look, she. as far as I'm concerned, she had a back brace sewn into that jacket of hers. I don't know what's going on with her. And she's not getting the $10,000 makeover at Pierre's in France anymore. But, uh, yeah. um, so, but it's interesting what she said as a kicker to this whole joke. And, and I don't want to go around insulting people. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Every immigrant is this. Every African-American is that. Every, you know, other person, Deplorable. With, you know, different religious beliefs or whatever. Yeah. You know, that is, that's childish. What do you think of Cory Booker's, and you didn't comment on him, and you feel free Oh, I, I adore no, him. What do you think about him saying, kick them in the shins, essentially? Start to get to that kind of political... Well, that was Eric Holder. Yeah, Eric Holder. Oh, Eric Holder. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know they all look alike. No, they don't. They don't. <laughs> oh, well done. You know, Hillary, yeah, I, I, I was, I, I was paid by Mark Zuckerberg to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, That's, what? I was paid by Mark Zuckerberg to say that. What does what does that mean? I'm wondering myself. Is that a, is that a that it, clip? But I never played it that far where that line came in. Is that a Jew versus Schwarzer thing? Because I, to me, oh, it was like maybe that could be like a, an anti-Semitic. That's uh, how I. That's how I took it. The whole thing reeks of a <laughs> of a subtext that yes. is just gross. Well, it, you have d- the lesbian subtext. You got the man hating su- subtext. You got the blacks or subtext. You got the Jewish subtext with Zuckerberg. You got the f- social media subtext. You got these two uh, sub. I mean, the whole thing stinks. I, 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 I was paid by Mark Zuckerberg to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, can I just say? No. What I what can I can I just say? You've been reading Trump's tweets beautifully. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So that's the big joke. Is like Trump uh, apparently it's, uh, doesn't see the difference between one brown guy and the other brown guy. Oh yeah, sure. That's that's the, that's never the big seen joke. One before now, the Zuckerberg comment is an because it. The way she said it to me was uh, in was an inside joke to a subgroup yes. of people that we were not part of. Nope, <laughs> to say the least. But we're not part of whatever group that was that joking was, about. That, that I don't know. If anybody that. out there can can deconstruct that joke, we'd be interested. No, I have to be. Sadly, that's. I, I immediately thought, what is this a, a Jew versus blacks thing? Which is you know another stereotypical be, uh, comparison. Be. So I do think it's important to listen to, uh, you know, the truth always wants to come out. Again, just the little clip of her maybe running is much longer, and she really unveils her entire strategy and when she's going to decide, which goes beyond what was clipped. And uh, if you find it too boring, we'll we'll get rid of it. But I I thought it was like, wow, she, she really is just telling everyone what she's going to do under the guise of, well, maybe not. But it, it was so obvious. We're going to talk about 2020 in a minute. Do you want to run again? No. Wait. No. That was a pause. Well, I, well I'd like to be president. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, I, I think, hopefully, when we have a Democrat in the Oval Office in January of 2021. Now, she's already thinking about herself. 
there's going to be so much work to be done. I mean, we have confused everybody in the world, including ourselves. And <laughs> we have confused our friends and our enemies. Right. They our have no idea friend. what the United States stands for, what we're likely to do, what we think is important. Uh, so the work would be work that I feel very... By the way, when she said, I think she's also just like, she, she almost, I think she feels... I shouldn't have to run. I should just become the president because I've been through so much. That's kind of what she said. Like, I want to be president. Just the running part is, can't we just anoint me? Very well prepared for. Yeah. Having- Don't you think there's something in there? I'm in total agreement on that, that thesis. Okay, now I'm going to back it up because now, now she switches to the from the someone to her including ourselves and (laughs) we have confused our friends and our enemies right they have no idea what the united states stands for what we're likely to do what we think is important uh so the work would be work that i feel very well prepared for having been in the senate for eight years having been a diplomat uh in the state department and it's just going to be a lot of heavy lifting so Um, are you going to be doing any of that lifting do you feel like oh i have no idea Kara. but i'm i'm going Uh to you know, I'm not going to even think about it till we get through this uh, November 6th election about what's going to happen after that. But now listen to what she's saying. I'm not even going to think about it. So she's already she already said this. I got to do a lot of work, but and, I'm not going to think. And, and before she ran in 2016, if you remember, she did the same kind of song and dance long enough to collect a lot of money that she didn't have to use for the campaign. Which is a part of this 13-city tour they'll be doing right after the uh, midterms. Yeah, there's money involved. Of course there's money involved. So I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure we have a Democrat in the White House come January of 2020. <laughs> so now, she, now just to, to reiterate, she said, I'm going to wait and see what happens during the midterm. And then, in other words, if she's going to run, but I'm going to make sure that there's a Democrat in the White House. And who among, we're going we're gonna to talk about your role in that in a second, but who among them are you interested in? Well, you know, I, I, no. I know everyone who's running and, or thinking of running or possibly running. Um, but, you know, there's, a, there's always that period between, hey, that sounds like a really good idea. And then trying to actually think it through, see if it is the right thing for you to do, see if you can raise the money. She is now discouraging everyone. And and I'm going to roll it back a little bit. What she's saying here is if uh, really no matter what happens, but let's say the Democrats don't take the, the House then it's going to be so hard. It's going to be. It's going to be really rough. You got to think about your family. I don't know if you can do this. There's only really one person who can do this. Who has the skin thick enough? Running or possibly running. Um, but you know, there's a, there's always that period between. Hey, that sounds like a really good idea. And then trying to actually think it through, see if it is the right thing for you to do, see if you can raise the money, all of the questions that go into it. So I'm not going to handicap uh, the race before anybody actually gets into it. Uh, I think there I think we'd have. A- so she, she literally said, I'm not going to handicap the race before anybody gets into it. So I'm not going to announce I'm going to let some schmucks come up first. So I can tell them you're never going to make it because I know how to do it. I know where the money is. Number of excellent candidates who would be uh, really formidable on the campaign trail. But let's wait and see who it is. I mean, we may have as many as 15, 20 candidates. And, you know, that that's a big group to try to sort itself out. Um, And. I'm just going to wait and, and uh, you know, watch it happen. Do you have anyone here See what schmucks show yeah, up. Yeah, really <laughs> Interesting. Um, wait, 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 what's she say here? I forgot. It's, it's, it's filled with gems like this. In 20 candidates. And, right. you know, that that's a big group to try to sort itself out. Um, and I'm just going to wait and, and uh, you know, watch do, it happen. Do you have anyone you're particularly <laughs> interested in? Um, no, I'm, I'm, you know, there, no, yeah. there, there are a number of, there are a number of, Excellent potential candidates. <laughs> no, listen. <laughs> There's no of excellent potential candidates. <laughs> you know, look, this, first of all, if we don't win on November 6th. I'm going to start 6th, naming names and see what you're saying. No, I, I, oh, okay, if you want to. But all if, right, I will. But if we okay, don't no, win, I'm going to. can I, okay, okay. But, if, but if we don't okay. win on November 6th, honestly, I mean, I know this sounds far-fetched, <clears throat> but this administration if they continue to control all branches of government and they have been stocking the courts with ideologues 
um, you will you will find that it will be much more difficult to run. She's, she's literally telling people, step out of the way. I can do it. And people who have never had to face the fire, once they get out there and they start being the target of the vitriol and hatred that comes against anybody who criticizes Trump, you know, that, that's going to cause a number of people to do a bit of soul searching. Huh. Um, so I, I think we've got to give everybody who is thinking. <laughs> and by the way, she didn't literally say it. I'm sorry. about it. Or even people who wake up on November 7th. And- Kicker's coming. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, here's the kicker. Last 30 seconds. And then <laughs> you'll like the end here. Oh, come on. What are you doing? Anybody who criticizes Trump, you know, that, that's going to cause a number of people to do a bit of soul searching. Um, so I, I think we've got to give everybody who is thinking about it or even people who wake up on November 7th and start thinking about it. Uh, right. We've got to give them, you know, the space to make what is a really serious calculation, depending upon right. what can the we, political situation is. Can we talk about individually? And then I want to get to Saudis. And so, uh, so, so she pretty much just said, I know everyone really well. You know, they're all going to have to think about it real hard, especially if we don't. She knows. That she, I think she sees the writing on the wall as a chance that the, they will not take the house. So, but, you know, that doesn't happen. I mean, you, if it does happen, it's great. But if it doesn't happen, you got to think real hard. You really want to do that. And now she, Kara Swish is going to mention some names. Um, Warren. What? Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Oh, Elizabeth's a great, you know. <laughs> Warren, what? <laughs> oh, oh, Elizabeth. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's fabulous. Blah, blah, blah. She's only thinking about herself, and she is running. Of course she is. I know, but no one picks up on the subtleties. It's never analyzed. Uh, this is true. It's, but I, I don't think it needs to be, and I don't think anyone's analyzing because everyone knows she's running. What's no, to analyze? Well, that's true. That's true. You know, it's almost like beating a dead horse. It's like, oh, she's running. Wow. Stop the presses. She was a little too happy. About the AI conversation that she had with Kara. Hmm. How would you encourage the government to handle AI? Just a few more, and then oh. I know you have to go. Cause it's wow, Whoa. we could talk about this for a long time. Oh, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Hillary. Yeah, no. It's got the crown. I think they don't mind hearing from yes, you. Yes, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things I wanted to do if I had been president was to uh, delve deeply into what we have to do about AI. I mean, if you follow the debate between people who are you know, quite knowledgeable about technology, it, it's like split right down the middle. There are those who think it's good. When you think of AI, what, what kind of things do you think of? What kind of applications? Because she's not, she's not, you'll see, she's not talking about AI. I think AI is a crock. It's going to be the demise Perfect. of the human race and those who think it's going to be, you know, the greatest breakthrough for the human race. She's not really talking well, about AI. we need AI. to figure out, you know, which is which and are there uh, are there plans we should make that would try to rein in uh, oh, some of the AI oh, wait before for it. it is wait for unloosed it. on the world? Now, other- <laughs> Did she say unloosed? She said unloosed. <laughs> is that, is that- she meant unleashed or loosed. I don't know what she meant. <laughs> You're out. But she said unloosed. You know, which is which? And are there, uh, are there plans we should make that would try to rein in uh, some of the AI before it is unloosed on the world. <laughs> now, other countries are moving very fast ahead, right, China being the, the best example. I mean- well, okay. She I'll, I'll, I'll no- kill it, but let me tell you the glee that she speaks about um, the Chinese social network tracking and penalty and reward system, she speaks about it with great glee. Yeah, she probably would like to She it. really wants it. A lot of people do. And she she referenced, did you see this clip of the Chinese bullet train, which I, I'm not sure if it's a hoax or not. Well, you don't know because we don't speak Chinese. No, and it's, it's, a, in it's subtitles. an ink. Oh, right, right. Well, it's 20 seconds. So this is on the bullet train, apparently, from Beijing to Shanghai, and this comes on the... Yeah, I, I believe it's a hoax, by the way. Not I think it's it. a hoax, too. This comes on the public address system. You can't hear it? I, you can barely hear it. Uh, I, I don't believe that's, I, I don't believe a word of it. Yeah, so what it says is if you, if, you're, if you are caught without a ticket, it'll go on your social score. That can give you penalties. You may not be allowed to travel on the train. And yeah, I, I'm all, like, all in English for some Yeah, I mean, I, I'm like, nah. but she refers to this clip. 
interestingly. Yeah, she. I'm sure she's suckered by more than a few of these things. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, a couple of things. I do have a um, a deconstructed clip, which I just thought this is a. Uh, well, first let's do a, a little change of pace clip. First of all, I have a ISO of Erdogan pronouncing Khashoggi. Uh, okay. Okay. As it, as it turns out, um, I have another pronunciation guide for us. Well, this is, uh, Al Sharpton's version. Jamal Khashoggi. Khashoggi. <laughs> <laughs> and you have an ISO, who's pronouncing it? Erdogan. Erdogan. Jamal Khashoggi. Well, interesting because Chef Clary sent his, uh, I think his business partner who's Arabic and here's how he pronounced it. Say it. Khashoggi. Khashoggi. So it's pretty close to Erdogan's version. Erdogan sounds pretty similar. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Jamal Khashoggi. Khashoggi. But he says Khashoggi. 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 Jamal Khashoggi. Well, Sharp is not that far off, actually. Yeah, Jamal he's not that Khashoggi. Far off. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Wait a minute. Al was doing it just like Erdogan. Hold on. Uh, oh. Jamal Khashoggi. Jamal Khashoggi. Well, pretty close. <laughs> Who yeah, knew? We're, we're mocking here. <laughs> we should, no more mocking. <laughs> like a shit show. Very nice. So I'm watching this. This was from about a month ago, or not quite, but maybe three weeks ago, when Alex Jones was on the uh, Joe Rogan show. Oh, it was a while ago, wasn't it? It was. It was m- months. M- months ago. Well, okay. I think it was months, but it was it was within recent memory. Yeah. And I don't think anybody picked up on this this particular little sub segment here. Which is when he, he play as Alex Jones on the Joe Rogan show, uh, the Alien. Who's got it? Oh, the, uh, uh, All right, let me give you my best of, deep research approximation. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. I'm gonna give you the big and slow. Joe, there yes. are aliens in this room right now. For real? Yeah, you're not of this world, bro. Me? You're the alien. Oh, <laughs> wow! I didn't know. Well, here's what the elite believe, and mm. let me be very clear because the media will take this out of context. I only go with what I can prove. Oh, and, thank you. And, and people can't even handle that. I don't know. All I know, do know is that after he told him that, he had, uh, Rogan, I think jokingly, came down to the microphone and made some sort of weird noise, <laughs> like like a lizard would. Is that in the beginning of this clip? It's it's no. It's when he as soon as he says it, let me hear. He says, "Oh, let- uh, no." As soon as he says it, and then he, then Rogan says, "Oh, I didn't know." And then he makes that sound. I don't know if you can catch it. Let me hear. Who's got him? All right, let me give you my best of deep research approximation. Are you ready? <laughs> Yes. I'm going to give you the big and chill out. Joe, there yes. are aliens in this room right now. For real? Yeah, you're not of this world, bro. Me? You're the alien. Oh, wow. I didn't know. Well, here's what the elite believe. And mm. let me be very clear because the media will take this out of context. Yeah. Right there. Oh, he's a lizard. Yeah, lizard. <sighs> yes. Yes is uncontrolled lizard sound. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hear it again. <laughs> believe. And mm. let me be very clear because the media will take this out of context. Oh, <sighs> Well, there goes all the invites for the Joe Rogan show. Well done, Joe. Yeah, yeah you're not of this world, bro. Anyway. Me? You're the alien. Oh. <laughs> now, I do have a uh, ISO of just for the end of the show possibility. Yes. Uh, that's you yeah, you're not alien. of this world, bro. Me? You're the alien. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, there are no other ISO, so I think you win it. No. Okay, good. That's very good. Very good. All right. Anyway, I want to get back to this one thing I, I, where I deconstruct. This is uh, it's starting to get really pathetic on democracy now. Yeah. And uh, so they're running these strange stories. And there's one the Federalist Society had uh, Jeff Sessions in a boss at a Boston meeting. And the Federalist Society is the one who's pretty much calling the shots on who, who Trump picks as a judge. Now, what, are they just like some kind of think tank? What do they do? Nah, it's a conservative think tank ish. Like drinking club. Cl- drinking club. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And. Uh, so he's giving a speech, and two people call him out, both black ministers from the area, and they play it a funny way. But there's a little piece of propaganda in here, which I just found just a little. Oh, you made the it, alien sound that Joe Rogan makes. No, but he did it by exhaling. Oh, I that's did true. It by okay, okay. Doing that. <laughs> Whew, got me scared for a second. Yeah. You're the alien, bro. Then I can't even do that sound he did. Um, 
This is a, but listen to this before. This is he, he, Sessions heckled in Boston. In Boston, Massachusetts, Attorney General Jeff Sessions was interrupted by two religious leaders at a Federalist Society event Monday, where Sessions was speaking about religious freedom. United Methodist Pastor Will Green stood up and recited biblical verse before appealing to Sessions directly. Brother Jeff, as a fellow United Methodist, I call upon you to repent, to care for those in need, to remember that when you do not care for others, you are wounding the body of Christ. Hmm. Jeff Sessions responded to the pastor by saying, thank you for those remarks and attack. A second pastor, Daryl Hamilton of the First Baptist Church in Boston, then stood up to speak, but was booed by other attendees and quickly removed by security. Hmm. Now, I couldn't right. quite hear what the pastor was saying. Oh, he's just telling me he's a jerk. Oh, OK. All right. Uh, the thing here is that it's the first the first Baptist Church. Uh, of Jamaica Plains is the church that the second guy came from. Mm -hmm. But she didn't want to say the First Baptist Church of Jamaica Plains, I believe, because it doesn't have the hold the authority of the First Baptist Church in Boston, which is what she said. Ah. And it's, and it's, a, it's dishonest. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Why do you watch that anymore? Because it's like I can get some of these great bits because she fluctuates from, you know, I mean, the kind of... It's really a dishonest show I, for a journalistic endeavor. It's, it's quite remarkable. So I can't, I can't keep it's my true. eyes. Yeah, I understand. I totally understand. Uh, meanwhile, they also reported and smeared Steve King uh, on Democracy Now! with a two-parter here. Steve, is Steve of, King is the congressman? Se King? I think he's a senator from uh, uh, Iowa or— uh, King is in New York, I thought, wasn't he? No, no, you're thinking of Peter King. Oh, right. Okay, wrong King. Yeah, different. Camp. Congress member Steve Stivers blasted Iowa Congress member Steve King on oh, Twitter Steve Tuesday, Stivers. saying blasted. Congressman Steve King's recent comments, actions and retweets are completely inappropriate. We must stand up against white supremacy and hate in all forms. And I strongly condemn this behavior. The tweet came as corporate supporters of Steve King, including Land Lakes and Purina Pet Care, as well as <laughs> Intel, said they would no longer fund King's campaigns. Congressmember King recently endorsed far-right Canadian faith Goldie for Toronto mayor and has amplified racist and anti-immigrant posts on social media, including publishing a racist tweet in support of far-right yeah. Dutch politician Gert Wilders last year. <laughs> oh, last week, it was reported King met with a neo-Nazi Austrian group during an August trip that was funded by a Holocaust memorial nonprofit. King later told The Washington Post if they were in America pushing the platform they push, they would be Republicans. <laughs> It was a, it was you know everybody in Austria is a Nazi I guess. Well, no, so, so she kind of smeared him there, but it gets a little better in the second clip. Until last year, Congressman King displayed a Confederate battle flag on his desk in the Capitol Hill office. King is up for re-election, is polling just one point ahead of his Democratic challenger, J.D. Scholten, in a district that Trump won in 2016 by 27 percent margin. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was it wasn't a Confederate battle flag. It was one of those state flags. Right. It's like he visits the state, he gets a flag. He's got a little collection of little flags from different states. Gosh, hey. I mean, this is really <clears throat> pathetic. Well, this whole you know, if I remember um, the the kid I grew up with, Hans, uh, you know, when we were like nine, and I, I you know, we see we, we were in contact for years and years and years, and I, but I hadn't seen him in the in the flesh. And when Tina and I were in Amsterdam I don't know, a year or two years ago, uh, he came. He was living in Spain. He came up and and he said, "It's you know, well, Adam, you're a Republican." I'm like, "What are you talking about? I'm not a Republican." Well, you are. I said, "I hear how you speak." So you know, you're probably racist. Now he's my friend, so he can say that he's gay, which made it even funnier. Um, and this meme of, in America, Republicans are racist, is very deep-rooted. I mean, it's, 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 it's been so hammered into everybody's... I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we had a conversation on the last show, and I said, I'd like to know from the black producers mainly, and we have a few, luckily, um, if you were taught this magical switch back in the 60s between the Republican and Democrat Party... Um, 
I've tallied up, and I probably got like 50 responses. Uh, the, really, the black responses were maybe only five, uh, but there were some uh, Mexican in there. And I'd say 95%, although no one can remember it being in their history books, can remember coming away from school believing that there had been some switch when the Democrats and Republicans switched and the racists sneakily went to the Republican Party. Um, which is interesting because, you know, there's, well, there's really this two, two sides. Some people say, I think it might have been the politicians switched or maybe the voters switched. But in general, most people said, yeah, I, I think that's how I was taught it. Did you see any of this? Did anyone send you any notes? You got you were copied I on a got few a of them. A couple of notes yeah. again, they're undocumented. It's kind sure. of sure. No, no, it's it's. But these are just their own experiences. So it's it's just completely. You're right. It's undocumented, but it's important for the reason that you have this block. That's why Candace Owens is being pushed so hard by the Trump administration and Kanye. Anything they can do to break the concept. Uh, for Black America, that they can only be saved by the Democrat Party is definitely culturally ingrained. And so removing just 5% of that, 10% would probably really ruin the whole voting, uh, you know, everything for the Democrat Party. And it dawned yes, on— Yes, unless they run a black person. The blacks do yes, vote yep, as yep, a— Yes, yep, yep, as a, They vote as a race. Yes. And, and so then all of a sudden I understood this— um, with the phrase is so tired, comprehensive immigration reform. How long have we heard that? A decade, 20 years? We've heard this forever. And suddenly I realize what it's about. And that's from one of our producers who's Mexican who said, I believe that the Republicans were racist when I came here with my parents. I have learned it's different. My parents definitely still believe Republicans are racist. And if you have a population in in the United States of 10, 15, 20, you know, it's somewhere conservative estimates 10, on the other side, 22 million illegal aliens. Um, the concept is comprehensive immigration reform can only happen, that's why there's no wall, you can only get that if you make those people legal. Because you do that in one fell swoop, you have 20 million Democrat voters. That's why it, you, there will ne- never be any immigration reform because that is the that is purely well, I the think issue. This has been discussed to death. Everyone knows this. Well, but uh, maybe I'm just slow. I don't think so. I think you know this too. I don't know. No, I, 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 don't I know no, I, I, no, I didn't. No, I didn't realize that it's not about new people coming in. See, that I was a little confused. Like, well, they just want voters to come. That's why they had to come across the border. Come, but no one ever really talks about. One one law could, you know, pretty much put the Republicans out of business forever. It's not really discussed that way. But uh, it, hmm? it, the Republicans can get there's younger Latino voters that vote Republican. Floridians vote Republican. Sure, and they're, sure. But in of course, there's also yeah, a percentage in general, of blacks. The ones that moved into Arizona and California, they're going to vote Democrat, vote Democrat right. because they've been sold right. a bill of goods. Um, I do have a professor of political science from Vanderbilt University who in uh, one fell swoop can explain the three myths of the switch if you're interested uh i know it annoys you but maybe we could just round off the topic we'll never have to revisit it well no we'll be revisiting it for a while because people keep writing in once uh, upon a oh. okay the, the, my concern is well, how long is this clip it's three minutes Ugh. well I, it's just worth listening to because it's just she's like, well I mean, is it different than what Denise D'Souza said? Yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, okay, it, I'll play it. Then. I think it's, it, yeah, because she really explains the whole breadth and more of what you were saying than what I was saying, actually. Once upon yeah. a time, every yeah. student of history, and that meant pretty much everyone with a high school education, knew this. The Democratic Party was the party of slavery and Jim Crow, and the Republican Party <laughs> was the party of emancipation and racial integration. Democrats were the Confederacy, and Republicans were the Union. Jim Crow Democrats were dominant in the South, and socially tolerant Republicans were dominant in the North. But then, in the 1960s and 70s, everything supposedly flipped. Suddenly, the Republicans became the racists, and the Democrats became the champions of civil rights. Fabricated by left-leaning academic elites and journalists, the story went like this. 
Republicans couldn't win a national election by appealing to the better nature of the country. They could only win by appealing to the worst. Attributed to Richard Nixon, the media's all-purpose bad guy, this came to be known as the Southern strategy. It was very simple. Win elections by winning the South. And to win the South, appeal to racists. So the Republicans, the party of Lincoln, were to now be labeled the party of rednecks. But this story of the two parties switching identities is a myth. In fact, it's three myths wrapped into one false narrative. Let's take a brief look at each myth in turn. Myth number one, in order to be competitive in the South, Republicans started to pander to white racists in the 1960s. Fact, Republicans actually became competitive in the South as early as 1928 when Republican Herbert Hoover won over 47 percent of the South's popular vote against Democrat Al Smith. In 1952, Republican President Dwight Eisenhower won the southern states of Tennessee, Florida, and Virginia. And in 1956, he picked up Louisiana, Kentucky, and West Virginia, too. And that was after he supported the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education that desegregated public schools and after he sent the 101st Airborne to Little Rock Central High School to enforce integration. Myth number two, Southern Democrats angry with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 switched parties. Fact, of the 21 Democratic senators who opposed the Civil Rights Act, just one became a Republican. The other 20 continued to be elected as Democrats or were replaced by other Democrats. On average, those 20 seats didn't go Republican for another two and a half decades. Myth number three, since the implementation of the Southern strategy, the Republicans have dominated the South. Fact, Richard Nixon, the man who is often credited with creating the Southern strategy, lost the Deep South in 1968. In contrast, Democrat Jimmy Carter nearly swept the region in 1976, 12 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in 1992, over 28 years later, Democrat Bill Clinton won Georgia, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. The truth is, Republicans didn't hold a majority of Southern congressional seats until 1994, 30 years after the Civil Rights Act. As Kevin Williamson of National Review writes, if Southern rednecks ditched the Democrats because of a civil rights law passed in 1964, it is strange that they waited until the late 1980s and early 1990s to do so. They say things move slower in the South, but not that slow. <laughs> so I think that's a pretty good explanation. Well, I'm not going to complain about the clip. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it was pretty good. It was interesting. It did bring in a few things. When she does talk about the states that voted for the Republicans mm -hmm. during that era before the Civil Rights uh, uh, Act passed, they, they always failed to mention Georgia and Alabama, which were two states that were strong Democrat states. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia's since become a strong Republican state, and they keep talking about it flipping back to back to blue, but it's red and blue. Right. And I'm. I think the whole thing should surround studying what happened in Georgia, ah. because jo Georgia would be the Key. probably the, the, the understanding the whole thing, uh, because why are they Republicans? According to her thesis or even mine or yours, uh, there, there's no reason for it right. uh, based on the thesis. Now, she's pro she, her premise at the beginning is the thing that we should take note of, which was that it's a bunch of leftists that came up with this idea. Mm -hmm. And there is a strategy underway, but it's not a Republican strategy. Right. It's a strategy of uh, to make them look like rednecks, suckering the mm -hmm. black community into being Democrats and not oh, doing yeah. anything yeah. for them, including. But uh, what did Obama do for the blacks? Nothing. <laughs> and by the way, when people voted for Obama. All the whites that voted for Obama, full, and I'm saying this because I'm white. Uh, is that it was expected that Obama would do something for the black community he did. specifically. He did. What? Well, hold on. Can't believe you don't remember. He got credited widely for this. 
Here Helping it, people yeah. just get by. No, here it is. Everybody in Cleveland, low minority, got Obama phone. <laughs> Keep Obama in <laughs> president, you know? He gave us a phone. <laughs> Remember? Obama yeah, phone. <laughs> the Obama phone, yeah. Yeah, he did a lot. That was great. He walked right into that one. <laughs> yeah, he did. You're right. It's like a pie in the face. Yeah. Now, now, since we're on this sort of this sort of discussion, there, I'm, I'm always looking out for these words that keep cropping up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and first of all, I got Jake Tap. This is a black representative bitching and moaning about something on the Jake Tapper show. And I want you to pay careful attention to this, to the, the usage of, of a specific word, which I think is going to be popular. But explain why you think it's different, because there are a lot of, and I, and I really mean this, a lot of good faith people, conservatives, who think this is a double standard. Bernie Sanders was calling, is, is calling for a political revolution of ideas. He has never incited violence. He has never talked about beating up protesters. He has never um, called anyone the enemy. He has said that Wall Street should be held accountable and they should go to jail for bringing America to the brink of collapse. Uh, but he, he's never incited Cited violence. He's never othered anyone. And when there were folks in our coalition that were doing that, I and others and the senators spoke up against that. And so I think that's why this is different. Donald Trump has had ample opportunity to check his coalition. Wow, that was a double, though. She did a great job. First, she used the othered as a verb. And then she said, I like others. She positioned herself as an othered. Yes, she did. And then she used the term checked his co check his coalition, which is a leftist concept. What does it mean? Check his it coalition. Means you check your coalition. It means you, you, you could take control of these people. So this, if you watch the way the Democrats do organizing, you see them, you know, there's a, but one boss and a bunch of people that do whatever they're told. And that's kind of what the Trump's expected to do the same thing on the other side. Well, I agree with you wholeheartedly on this othered because well, let me tell you where this came up. And I and uh, someone's going to have to help me find uh, a copy. I was just scanning through the channels the other day and I pop. I happened to uh, bump up to Supergirl, which uh, I played a clip of Supergirl when it's like the president's not a, an eight year old. Remember that? And I thought it was a cartoon. Turns out it's live action. It's actually acted and it's on the CW. And on the episode I saw, which I need to clip, there's some aliens who have come in and they are they're They're called the others. There's othering. They'll be othered. And it was completely Trump and uh, immigrants. You got to go get that. I have to send me a copy. The whole the whole episode was about it. And it was the other that kept others being othered. The whole thing. It's yes. You're so right. Well, here here it is on the view. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you've you've caught on to it. Country is in a place that it's never been before because the tone is coming from the top. All of a sudden, it's okay to say, you know, I would punch out that reporter. All of a sudden, it's it's okay to otherize people. (laughs) And people on both sides. And there are good people on both sides. I mean, we've come to a point where people... We need to have all kinds of uh, versions of this. Uh, You have an otherization. I like the otherized I've been otherized. Uh, I've been otherized. Yes. Oh, my goodness. This is... That's the t-shirt idea. I've been otherized. Or just other. (laughs) The t-shirt just says other. Yeah, well, that, that would work, too. That is... That's good. So now we have to pay attention to this, this otherized. And I, it's, well, this is part of identity politics. This no the kidding. It's like a classic example of identity politics: is you other people, and then they're your enemy. But it's it's better than that because now you because, don't now you don't have to say you, you know you're as group because you're a different color or religion or gender. You're just other. So everybody can other. wear that. Everybody can wear that. I'm sure. other because I have Tourette's. You know, I'm otherized, man. Don't otherize me, bro. Yeah, you are. You're othered. Good I'm gonna catch. Other, I'm going to othered you. Good. <laughs> no, d- but hey. it's so dumb. The, the phrase is idiotic. It's stupid. And it makes you sound dumb. Well, be on the lookout for it, producers. We need more othering. I'm going to show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, on No Agenda. All right, we do have some people to thank for show 1082, beginning with uh, Sir Robert of the Sous Vide uh, in Holland. Holland. He's in Holland. Oh, no. Uh, 
He's going to make baronet soon, he says. Angela mm-hmm. Mackie Rutledge, a parts unknown in the in the Netherlands. Let me see where is she in the Netherlands. Oh, it doesn't say. 12111. Uh, then we have a blank line. <laughs> yes, I, I see that too. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a comma. Uh, hmm. Or not a comma, but a... Uh, Apostrophe is the name of this person from from uh, from uh, Deutschland. A late to the party donation. He or she writes greetings from Westerwald. Okay, well, whoever from Westerwald gave us one hundred eleven dollars. <laughs> Hello, Westerwald. Here's the here's the half. <laughs> we want to thank you, <laughs> Curtis Mason, Spokane Valley, Washington. One hundred eleven dollars eleven cents. So there's there's the two leftovers from the. Uh, from the well wishers, Preston Thaler, hundred dollars and thirty one cents. Avinash Persad in Port St. Lucie, Florida, ninety nine ninety nine. Han uh, Kaiser's in Leiden, in Leiden, and he wants to thank Boss Brunix yeah, for Brunix. calling him out on Thursday's show. Hey, Brunix, good work. Uh, I've been listening ever since. Never donated that de douche time. <laughs> You've been de douched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brunix, today, today. Brunix used to send a lot of art in and he gave yes. up. Well, it's, it's. We were picking him it's once a tax, in a while. It's taxing, man. It's taxing. It is a lot of work. Uh, Ward Detweiler in, Detweiler in uh, Gross Point, Michigan, 8008. Uh, what does he say here? Anything interesting? Oh, yes, yeah, he, he does say about, something. Yeah, he does. I got something I got to read. Yeah. So I, I got a couple of notes on this. So I say, John, I, 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 your wait, no, I just love it. You're like, well, that's too long. I don't want to play that. You can stop this. But then he has long notes on mustard. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the other man. I understand your pain about the lack of real Dijon mustard in the United <laughs> States, but I have a remedy. Edmund Fallot. Uh, which I've had their their mustards. I haven't ordered it directly from Amazon Prime. Uh, is the real deal, and I put it on everything. Okay, uh, I got another note <laughs> from someone saying that the Trader Joe. And let me ex- express my complaint. It was on a show or two ago. Yes, that uh, that uh, the, uh, all Dijon mustard in uh, America is uh, flat. Is, is rancid. No, it's not rancid. <laughs> it's you have flat. To have oil in it to it's be flat. rancid. It's flat. It's flat. It's flat. It loses its oomph. And when you go to France and have Dijon or you bring a bottle over, it's good for a couple of weeks and then it starts going flat. Even it should be refrigerated and uh, to, to shorten the length of time before it goes flat. Because Dijon mustard is almost like wasabi when it's fresh. It's wasabi. Just hot. And it goes right through the nose. It's dynamite stuff. Mm. And uh, it's all flat. There's nothing. It's like eating uh, nothing. It's like eating Grey Poupon American style as opposed to the Fr- French one they ship into Canada. Uh, so I bitched about this. So he's got this one solution, which I'll check out because I know this brand. I've had it before, but I've never had it this way. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's for, and then it, somebody else is the Trader Joe's branded Dijon. Hmm. And Trader Joe's, as you know, is a German grocery store chain. Uh, Aldi. Wasn't, wasn't it Aldi? Well, yes. <clears throat> yes. It's all, yeah. But it's it's a split off. Aldi, yeah. yeah. The, two, the two brothers, they had an argument. One wanted to sell cigarettes. The other one didn't. So they split the company. Yeah. And so then they bought Trader Joe's years and years ago, and it became this German company. So it's got a lot of characteristics. So it's possible that the uh, Dijon – I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to go to go there and buy some. So I'll, I'll, I'll catch up to this because <laughs> everyone's on pins and needles. Uh, yes, we can't wait. You know, Woo! Can you taste that mustard? So you know the Smothers Brothers? Yeah. The Others Brothers. Hey. Are you talking? Yeah, you got us, Carolyn baby. Blaney in Toronto, Ontario, sixty nine, sixty nine. Um, Dvorak movie reviews, please. They are spot on. <laughs> Sir Chris James in Sturgis, Michigan, six zero zero six. Yeah, small boob. Jeffrey Sewell in San Jose, California. Did I see you at the meetup? Five six seven eight. Robert Bruckner, fifty five, fifty five. Parts unknown. And the following people are fifty dollar donors. Name and location, if if available. William Cameron in Charlotte, North Carolina. Tyler Schimpf in Bothell, Washington. Jeremy Cartwright in Rockford, Illinois. And short list, mm-hmm. Sir Watson in Raleigh, North Carolina. That concludes our group of uh, producers for show 1082. I want to thank each and every one of them and the ones who gave lesser amounts for yeah. helping us. Yeah, the list was only 74K, as in kilobytes. 
it. Yes. <laughs> you're like, when you see that file come in, you're like, oh, your, file. your heart sinks. <laughs> like, oh, it's only 50K, 70, 70 kilobytes. Mm, okay. But we are so grateful for the producers who are producing this show in the way that producers do. Really, thank you very much. Uh, we learned so much from you. I mean, where else can you have a, 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 I mean, does NPR, when they do their donor drives, do they talk about Dijon mustard? No. Or do they? They don't. No, they give away tote bags. We give you something worthwhile. But more importantly, this is what makes the network work. All the people who, who keep saying, you keep me sane, or because we're making jokes, or whatever it is, whatever sauce we have, it seems to work. I'm very proud of it. You should be too, all you producers. Also, those who donated under $50, uh, many for reasons of anonymity and others on our subscriptions. Please take a look at those. And you can do that at Dvorak.org slash NA. Multiple karmas. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. You've got karma. Well, short donations, also short on the birthday list, uh, but we do have two. Sir uh, Jason Zeisler says happy birthday to his brother Joe Zeisler, turns 38 uh, tomorrow. And Carolyn Blaney says happy birthday to John Fletcher. Wait a minute, Fletch? Is it the Fletch's birthday? 35 today. And as a third, Sir Chris the Drunken Minstrel says happy birthday to his son Felix, who turned 29. Oh, two turn. <laughs> he'll, he'll think that's funny. Who turned nine years old on the 29th of October. We say happy birthday to all of these people. People from the best podcast in the universe. And we have we have a knighting. We have a knighting. That's why I got my sword here. Sword oh here. It's right sword. here. It's already out. Okay. Oh. Careful. Don't put an eye out with that thing. Sir Finch Nasty. Step on up. Wait, I'm sorry. Jose Cabral. That's who we have. Sir Finch in a minute. Jose Cabral. Come on up to the podium here. At the uh, round table, the No Agenda Knights and Dames, this is our sacred ceremony where thanks to your contributions of $1,000 or more in aggregate to the No Agenda show, we proudly pronounce the KD, Sir Cabral of Myers, My, <laughs> Masary Kid Town. <laughs> For you, we have hookers and blow, rent boys and chardonnay, steel reserves and black milds. We got pinball and power curves, breast milk and pablum, ginger ale and gerbils, bong hits and bourbon, and mutton and mead. Let me take that name again. Sir Cabral of Masaryk Town. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Correctly? Masaryk Town? There's a K in there. That is uh, odd. Well, he'll let, us, he'll let us know if that is incorrect. We'll gladly correct yeah. the record. And... <laughs> So there he is. There's uh, Sir Finch Nasty, who wanted to short shorten his title to Sir Finch, and we're perfectly fine with that. Uh, I'm sure that will be reflected in all of our peerage maps. You can find it at itm.im slash peerage. And thank you again, Sir Finch Nasty, Sir Cabral, and uh, our birthday list. And thank you for supporting the No Agenda Show, best podcast in the universe. Another one uh, for you on Sunday. Twice a week now. Twice a week, I heard that. Uh, let's see, I've got, uh, I do have something left here. Other. Uh, what did I have? Yeah, I can keep. Well, that. I oh, oh I have, I have, I have a, can- a Scandinavian clip, which I desperately want to talk about, or I'd, oh. at least play. As there's some controversy going on, and this is the uh, the about the 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 census, the Canadian census. And they need to have data on everybody. We have it here in the United States as well. And there's always there's always questions about what form, what's on the form, on the long form. Do you have to say what race you are? And, you know, what are the races that should be there? It's always a, a big there's argument. always something. Always something. Well, the Scandinavians, you know, they're just taking it one step further. StatCan, which is uh, Canada's statistical organization of the government. I believe it's a government organization. Statistics Canada. Could be wrong about that, too. Um, they've decided there's a better way to get some real census on our northern neighbors. Honorable Prime Minister. 
Our government is ensuring that the personal data of Canadians are protected. Statistics Canada will use the anonymized data for statistical purposes only. No personal information will be made public. I understand Statistics Canada is actively engaged with the Privacy Commissioner's Office on this project and is working with them to ensure Canadians' banking information remains protected and private. I'm just going to give a little context. What they are going to do is they're taking a sample of 500,000 Canadians and they are telling the banks they want all their information, all their purchase information. It will be anonymized, of course. And you can imagine there's some issue with this. High quality and timely data are critical to ensuring the government programs remain relevant and effective for Canadians. Honorable Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government plans to access the personal financial information of Canadians without their knowledge or consent. Personal information like bill payments, online purchases, credit card transactions, cash cash withdrawals and deposits, even e-transfers between family members, and the list goes on. Will the Prime Minister do the right thing and immediately assure Canadians that this intrusion into their lives will be stopped? Right on over, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians rightly expect that uh, government agencies and, uh, and, indivi- and uh, groups like Statistics Canada uh, work with the Privacy Commissioner to ensure uh, that their private lives are protected. But, Mr. Speaker, need I remind you and all Canadians uh, that it was the Conservative government that chose to stop the long-form census, to cancel the long-form census uh, as a way of uh, protecting people's private information. What that led to was more policy based on ideology and less policy based on evidence like we are doing now. Their attacks on data and information continue. Shut up, slave! <laughs> we'll do whatever we want. <laughs> that's, Pretty much. That's what could possibly go wrong with that. We need to cover more Canadian stuff in the next uh, you know, I weeks. get notes from, from uh, new, newer Canadian listeners and they're like, hey, really love the show, love the, you know, you talk about Canada, you're pretty ill-informed. <laughs> it's like, yes! Absolutely, we're ill-informed. We need as much help as we can get. Yep. Well, Canada stuff. Yes. We're not that ill-informed. No, but I. I well, look, I have. I can't uh, refute. Know, I can't refute some kid running the country. We know that much. Can't refute. Can't refute some kids running the country. Oh, Anne Hathaway uh, got an award at the Human Rights Council for what? Well, you have to know what the Human Rights Council is. Uh, they really only do one thing and that is uh support lgbtq issues that's 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 all that they do and they do about 45 million dollars a year this uh, and they're lobbying they're 501c4 and so they gave her an award and so the whole i'm I'm pretty sure it was in uh, california the whole room is not First of all, Anne Hathaway, she's massively wealthy. Her career is unreal. If you, she's from a kid. She's done. She's been in so many huge hit movies, but she's acting all the time. She this this thing on this podium was just an act. And I just had two clips because it was like, wow, kind of a head shaker of uh, of what she's saying. So she's she's virtue signaling. She, you know, I, as far as I know, she's not uh, uh, gay or uh, or transgendered or anything. Uh, she does talk about that, but the the whole audience is LGBT, well, officially LGBTQQIAAPK people, and uh, she won the award, and she's very happy, and she wants to say hi to everybody, first of all. We'll learn something. All right, let's get started. Ladies. Ladies. <laughs> Gentlemen. Gentle them. Yeah! <laughs> I've never heard gentle them. I think it's on the list. It's a it's whole the new category. Who call themselves they. It's the pronoun for people who are mm, pronouned they. Mm, mm, okay. Like, like there's more than two of them. I think them would be their uh, group to uh, call out. There's a little guide to this with about maybe twenty of these. Well, then she there. then she actually does. What about mo- the G's and all these other ones. <laughs> There's she, like a lot of them. She well, has to do all of them. Well, she does my, I, incorrectly, she does my, uh, my list. Thank you for this tremendous honor. What I love most about this community 
is the way you own the alphabet. L, G, B, T, T, Q, Q, I, A, A, P. No letter left behind. She forgot the K. She and left out the K. And she forgot a B for by curious, although just this discriminate against them. Um, so, it is important oops. to acknowledge that. Sorry. So now she's going to, this is the second clip. She's going to explain, explain to us as a very wealthy, very successful acting straight white woman. She's going to explain to us what's wrong with society. It is important to acknowledge that with the exception of being a cisgender male, everything about how I was born has put me at the current center of a damaging and widely accepted myth. A myth. This is the show of myths, John. There's another myth. Myth is that gayness orbits around straightness. Uh Uh-huh. Transgender orbits around cisgender, and that all races orbit around whiteness. (laughs) Yay! What? (laughs) What? Listen to that. We clearly do not understand because this audience gets it, whatever she just said. This myth is wrong. Wrong. But this myth is too real for too many. So, so gayness orbits cisgender and trans orbits... Oh, I forgot it already. It is ancient, so it is trusted. It is a habit, so it's assumed to be the way things are. It's inherited, so it's thought immutable. Its consequences are dangerous because it prioritizes a certain type of love, a certain kind of body, a certain kind of skin color, and does not value in the same way anything it deems to be other to itself. Other! It is a myth that is with us from birth, And it is a myth that keeps money and power in the hands of the few instead of being invested in the lives of the free. I appreciate this community. She's crying. So much. (laughs) Because it's where I learned to reject this myth. I appreciate this community because together we are not just going to question this myth. We are going to destroy it. <laughs> now, I would say we're, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're pretty damn gay friendly on this show and other friendly. Other. But uh, I really would like to understand what this orbiting thing is. I re- it was clearly written for her. I just don't understand it. And then to say that this keeps money away from the people who need to be free. They're sitting no. on $45 million a year, which they give to politicians and other lobbying, uh, lobbyist groups. Yeah, let's get our act together. She says the, the benefits the the few and doesn't benefit the lives of the many is where it should have been. But she says the lives of the free. free. Yes. Yeah, maybe she blew that line up. It's possible, but I, the whole thing was like, since why? Did, when does gay circle cis? I don't understand what it means. Like it's less than because it's an orbit, and we're the and uh, the cis. Of course, whitey, white man, old white man, white, whitey, whitey, white. I even whitey. saw in the troll room someone say it's hard to convince old white guys. That's it's fine, you know. Because it, here's the good news: yeah, ageist and oh, yeah. racist. But it doesn't phase me. Does it bug you? It doesn't bug me. Does it? Does it create any? Hang in your system when you hear that. I like to bitch about it. Yeah, but it's not like <gasps> I'm shocked. Or I'm, I'm always like, well, I'm not shocked by too much. I mean, this show is a stabilizing influence on my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, finally, I we're everybody- we're hated. <laughs> we're a ca- we're going to be the other. Get used to it. Get used to this other. word. We're being uh, otherized. Just, uh, let's back off and and take one more look at an earlier assertion of this show. What are the Democrats thinking? The United States is seventy two percent self described whites. Yes, that includes white Latinos. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
why are you trying to offend 72 percent of the voting public and think you're going to win a lot of elections and then going even further by promoting a socialist agenda, which is designed just to take money away from people? Uh, I mean, it's just baffling to me what yeah. they're thinking. And. and- and there's a lot of them thinking that way, and I feel bad. Of whites. I mean, you got your Bill Mars, you got yeah, people yeah. on that panel. They're all the hate, hating on Whitey, but I mean, and, and Anne Hathaway. Take a look in the mirror, lady. You're a <laughs> white woman. What? Dogs are people too. Finally, finally, we got it. A study in PLOS. I think that's a real uh, journal, isn't it? Real scientific I've journal. I've never heard of it. PLOS One. I, well, we've read things from there a lot. Anyway, that's where this study is uh, published. It is a study from uh, University of Sydney, and here it is. I'll give you the abstract. Uh, the results of the study show that human compulsion to seek out animal companionship is one of the primary factors affecting our climate. Particularly, no, particularly in the United States, where there are 163 million companion animals, roughly one pet for every two Americans, the highest number of any country in the world. And the climate cost of this, mainly because yeah, Americans are the largest pet owners in the world, but the tradition of pet ownership in the U.S. has considerable costs. As pet ownership increases in some developing countries, especially China, and trends continue in pet food toward higher content and quality of meat, globally, pet ownership will compound the environmental impacts of human dietary choices. Yes, indeed, the number one thing we can do right away to combat climate change to stay below that 1.5 degrees before 2030 is kill all the dogs. Dog haters. Finally, they finally emerged. We were waiting for this. And this is great because you can make someone's head. You know, now, if it's a dog, like, you know, that dog is actually causing climate this is change. Like, this, is the, this is the equivalent of fractal, as it were, yeah, oh. to bring that thing back in. Of your old thing about blowing people's minds by telling them a, in a climate change argument, do you believe in peak oil? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, you don't have to worry about it because uh, we'll run oil out of oil. Take care of the problem. Yeah. Run out of oil. But of course, they had to kill the peak oil meme. Yeah, completely. <laughs> When's the last time you heard the term? Except right this second. Yeah. So now they got this to deal with. Well, that kind of fits in with the World Wildlife, the WWF report about all the all the. By the way, this report, I and this is pushing toward the 2020 big meetup that has something to do with the Paris Accords. Oh, of course. And, and of course, it's good 2020 will match. We, we got to get these back in play, so don't vote for Trump. This is what it's really about. But I have been hearing about this forever, This th- forever, for since the 70s. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, well, we know that. I got a clip. We got a clip. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, WWF report. Ah, my mistake. In environmental news, humans have annihilated wildlife over the past half century, threatening life on Earth as we know it. That's according to a damning new report by WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. The report finds human activity since 1970 is responsible for wiping out 60 percent of mammals, birds, fish and reptiles, with the remaining animals threatened by a degraded, overexploited environment and the effects of climate change. This is Mike Bennett, executive director of Science and Conservation at World Wildlife Fund. What we need now is for heads of states to step up and take ownership of this problem and show real leadership. <laughs> give us money. Yeah, so that, that's what step up means. <laughs> give us some dough, man. Give us some money. Step up means yes. give us money. Step it up, bro. So, All right. so my last clip, how are we doing? Yeah, we're just time to go. Yeah, we're done. Okay, yeah. I got the last one then. Yeah. Or you can have it. No, go, no you go. You go. So it looks like the Weinstein uh, trial is falling apart. Uh oh! I mean, the guy's ruined, but they—they're not going to. But he's not going anywhere. to jail, is what you're saying? Yeah, it's falling apart. And so here, I, all I got it. This was like one of those uh, clips that just is floating around. It was CNBC N or whatever the network version. They just play stuff, you know, just like RT does. This is Weinstein's attorney just t- talking to the to the mic, and then the defense attorney of the woman 
And this is not really enlightening or anything. It's just a nice little short summary clip. This is not about victim shaming, and this is not about suggesting that a uh, woman who comes forward should not be believed uh, absent proof. This is about uh, proof that a witness who came forward committed perjury in the grand jury. And what happened here is Harvey Weinstein was so vilified that he was considered to be low-hanging fruit. You just indict him and you worry about uh, convicting them later. And, you know, what's happened is now that I'm drilling down on some of these allegations and the district attorney's office is drilling down on these uh, allegations, this case is not what it was cracked up to be. I want to be very clear that the prosecution's decision to abandon my client's claims does not invalidate the truth of her claims. It does speak to a system desperately in need of reform. The DA threw away Lucia's claims, but this says nothing about Weinstein's innocence, <laughs> nor does it reflect on Lucia's consistent allegation that she was sexually assaulted with force by Harvey Weinstein. It only speaks volumes about the Manhattan DA's office and its mishandling of my client's case. Yeah, he's walking. He's, yeah. he's going to walk. Totally. Sad. Yeah. Sad, really. Because, uh, you know, there is there is some reality to what's going on, but mis, 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 abused, really. Abused for political gain. Abused for ratings. And, uh, and obfuscated for the exact same reasons. No, uh, it's a political football. These women are being othered. They are othered. By the way, I have I have the peak oil of the dogs. It's actually for myself. I don't have to worry because here's what's going to happen: as climate change makes temperatures warmer, crops fail. We have a global food shortage. We start eating the dogs and cats. Fixes climate change. Dynamite, right? Yeah, no, I'm all in. <laughs> Dinner at my place. I'm not a dog hater, by the way. I, I actually like dogs. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. That's our show, everybody. We will be back on Sunday with another uh, deconstructive episode for you. And remember us to support our Value for Value network and our entire Value for Value methodology at Dvorak.org slash NA. NoAgendaShow.com is where you can find the latest show and links to the show notes and the archives and the search and everything. And and coming to you from downtown Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State, FEMA Region 6 on the governmental maps in the 5 by 9 Cludio in the common law condo. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from northern Silicon Valley, where uh, I got to see, by the way, the, the coastal went by, which is another big train. And it had a little attachment on the end, but it was looked like a cheapie. It looked like some cheap little thing some guy had rented. Anyway, I'm John C. Dvorak. That's your update on uh, the trains. <laughs> All right. Good by. That's right. It's Fomer and the Crackpot, everybody. Woo! Until Sunday. Adios, mofos! Cyberspace. I wear power ties, I tell power lies, I take power naps, I run victory laps. I read junk mail, I eat junk food, I buy junk bonds, I watch trash boards. I'm tireless and I'm wireless. I'm an alpha male on beta blockers. Interactive, I'm hyperactive. From time to time, I'm radioactive. I take it slow, I go with the flow, I ride with the tide, I get line in my shirt. I don't snooze, so I don't lose. I keep the pedal to the metal and the rubber on the road. I've been pre washed, pre cooked, pre heated, pre screened, pre approved, pre packaged, dated, freeze dried. Pre washed, pre cooked, pre heated, pre screened, pre approved, pre packaged, dated, freeze dried. And. I'm hanging in, there ain't no doubt, and I'm hanging tough over and out, over and out.
You're not of this world, bro. Me? You're the alien. Oh.